Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Today is Thursday, April 14th, and the time is 9, 12 a.m. The AB 3121 task force meeting is now called to order. Good morning. My name is Camila Moore, and I'm the chair of the task force. Before we begin, let's have the staff do a roll call for attendance and establish whether we have a quorum. Parliamentarian Johnson. Present. Present. Member Bradford? Here. Member Grill? Present. Member Holder? Member Joan Sawyer? Member Lewis? Present. Member Tamaki? Present. Member Montgomery Step? Here. Madam Chair, excuse me. There are nine members on the task force. Five members are needed for a quorum, and there are seven members present, and a quorum has been established. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. So before we proceed to public comment, I'll turn to Vice Chair Brown for some remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. To all the members of our task force, again, I share with you our appreciation for the very substantive and significant way in which you have been involved in this first historic in-person hearing here in Northern California in the city of St. Francis. And I thank our chair for the very fine way in which she led us in our deliberations on yesterday. Finally, I wish as a matter of information to say that for the benefit of those of you who were not able to attend last evening's solidarity, service, reparations, you missed an incredible life experience. But thanks to technology, we're gonna make sure that that message, that historical, theological, <coughs> socially relevant statement of the altness, the necessity for reparations will go down in history as one of the iconic addresses regarding the liberation of African Americans and sons and daughters of Africa. So let's get on with today's session and continue the splendid things that we are saying and that we shall do when we keep the faith and never give up on reparations, an idea whose time has come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chair Brown, for those opening remarks. We'll now turn to agenda item number 14, which is public comment. Um, I'll now turn to Ms. Aisha Martin-Walton. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Moore, Task Force members. My name is Aisha Martin-Walton. I am with the Department of Justice, and the task force would like to hear from you. The public comment period will be for one hour, for each, and each person will have three minutes to speak. Because we are in person today, we will take the first, um, the first half hour will be in person. So if you have a comment, if you could please line up and uh, we will take the in-person comments first and then we will transfer to the uh, callers. So with that, uh, the only other advisal is please be advised that in fairness to everyone, that at the three minute mark, you may be politely interrupted. However, just know that public comment period is for everyone and you may always submit written comments via the email at reparationstaskforce at doj.ca.gov. So with that, can we have the first commenter? Exciting. Um, good morning, I am Friday Jones. My name is Constance Jones Muhammad. I am the 
National uh, Facilitator for the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants, co-facilitator for the Los Angeles chapter, also a member of CJEC. I'm very privileged and glad to be here this morning. I've had the experience of having all of you on our show, Politics in Black, um, to bring information and awareness to reparations, and I thank you um, for being part of that. Um, yesterday, uh, a Tribe Called Quest and the Wu-Tang Clan were inducted into our congressional archives um, because they were culturally relevant. Their bodies of work were culturally relevant. Um, Ali Shaheed Muhammad is my brother, so I will give my brother some love and his accomplishment, but uh, this is culturally relevant. This is my body of work. This will be the last legacy that I will leave on this planet Earth before I depart it. And so with that, um, I just want to say that it's important for us to give our talents. We are here in service. The work that I do, I'm not compensated for, but we are here to be of service. And um, I want to uh, ask, uh, specifically, she is not here today, but Dr. Holder, um, Dr. Grills, you are a champion. People know you in community. Your work has its own uh, sound to it, and it is meaningful. And we need the best of you, um, Tamaki. We need the best of you showing up for the work that needs to be done here today. Um, that's all I have to say. I saw this little song in the hymn book that I picked up. We've come a long way. We've come a long way, Lord, a mighty long way. We've borne the burden of the heat of the day. Um, we've come a long way. We have come a long way as a people. This work is culturally relevant. I thank you so much for your time. ETM Media has been holding up space. So as you all have to consider, other media companies, consider them. They've been vigilant. Their social media and capturing of these uh, ceremonies has been exquisite. So that's what I have to share. And thank you all so much for this work that you're doing. Thank you, Ms. Jones. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, my name is Josiah Williams. Good morning, Chair Moore, Vice Chair Brown, and members of the task force. Um, I'm a member of Coalition for a Just and Equitable California, known as CJEC, and also the American Redress Coalition of California. Um, today I'm speaking as an individual. Um, initially, I had wanted to speak today about what different forms of reparations should take, but I, I noticed that um, after the historic vote for a lineage-based reparations, we keep coming in contact with people um, that is against it. Um, different witnesses that come to speak, um, they consider it, they can consistently insert their personal ideology that reparations must be instead repaired for um, more than just the descendants, but basically make it an all lives matter reparations uh, bill. I encourage all that feel this way yesterday, today, and forevermore to either push your feelings to the side or create your own reparations bill to cure racism. You can call the bill whatever you would like. I bid you uh, safe travels. And, and on your endeavor. But that's not what we're here to do today. I also need to address um, how someone or some people believe that um, my specific community repair is considered a win for white supremacy because somehow we are on the same boats dropped off at different locations, um, different people from the um, diaspora that, that face uh, slavery. Um, also, the note that um, Representative Sawyer has said that um, we were brought here on slave ships or planes, we're all in the same boat, something to that effect, which I, I found very disrespectful. Um, I would like to challenge both of those ideas. Um, if I met the re requirements to receive a degree from a major institution in the United States and they deny giving it to me, could I demand a degree from the University of Cambridge and say, same degree? different school, um, why must my repair be considered master tools or divisive? Do anyone here only eat or sleep when everyone eats or sleeps? Would a lawyer deny taking on a case of racism because cases of racism around the globe must be included? Would a psychiatrist or a psychologist tell clients that their specific trauma isn't unique because people are facing trauma around the world and they are using master tools by trying to address their drama. These things wouldn't happen in real life and it won't happen here. The work we are doing is the next phase of the civil rights movement. The baton is in a safe place. We took it 
out of the hands of those before of us that wanted to hold on to it, but it's in good hands. We don't want $6 million mansions. We demand community uplift and full repair for the descendants of U.S. chattel slavery. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Good morning, um, Task Force. My name is Sharice Cryer. Um, I just wanted to revisit the edits um, Chairman Moore suggested uh, last month that were rejected. I encourage the task force to revisit the substance of those edits because they have merit. According to a study, bring, uh, being black in corporate America, the black immigrant population in the United States has increased fivefold since 1980, and black immigrants have often have different perspectives than American-born black people on what it means to be black in America. According to the report, white people tend to prefer and give better opportunities to Afro-Caribbeans over African-Americans. African-Americans are more likely than immigrants from Africa to say their colleagues have underestimated their intelligence. That's from a New York Times article. Um, Full-time professionals of Afro-Caribbean descent are more likely than those with African or African-American roots to have access to senior corporate leaders, the study found. So I think the task force should acknowledge that black Americans are at the bottom caste in this country. And also we should be, um, the task force should mention in the report that's coming out that we should be part of a specially uh, protected class. Um, the next issue I wanna bring up is the language um, and the standard for, for reparations uh, that's coming out in the report. Um, you know, there's been a discussion of lineage-based reparations and also um, targeting freedmen before 1900. That doesn't make any sense. I'm not sure what the significance of the time period of 1900 is. I think that might be a misinterpretation of Dr. Weber's intent. So I encourage the task force to revisit um, either if that was made in a motion or whatever, but we would not have freedmen uh, before 1900. Everyone was free in 1900. So I would encourage you to revisit um, what that language was for and why you're using that because it's in direct contradiction to lineage-based reparations. Finally, um, I wanna discuss the communications or kind of lack thereof. Dr. Grills, I do wanna acknowledge the effort that you put in to get um, the grants and get the money um, So for the communications firm. Um, but my family and my friends don't really know what's going on with this task force unless I'm telling them. And if you look in here today, there aren't a lot of people in the audience and I think that is um, unfortunate. This is a historic effort. This is a historic moment. This church should be full. I mean, the lines, you know, people should be calling and the lines should be ringing off the hook. So if we can, you know, uh, I would encourage you to, to get the information out in a better way to the community so that they can all participate. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Chris Larson, Coalition for Justice and Equitable California, CJC. Uh, speaking on my own, Volition, I think that's the word. So first I want to reiterate something I said yesterday in my public comments, which is the opposition to AB 2296 introduced by member John Sawyer, who's, who I don't know if he's here today. That bill would extend your work by one year into 2024, but you were not told about that. You were not asked about that. You did not ask for that. You did not discuss that as a task force. So to introduce that without consultation to you, quite frankly, I find is disrespectful to your work and to the efforts that you put in, I believe unpaid here in many ways. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I want to also reiterate something that Sharice just said about the communications. I understand that's gonna be a topic of discussion today. I think we do need to bring in additional communications support and I'm looking forward to your discussions on that today, and I encourage you to do that. The other thing I want to say is, so CJEC is one of your six community anchor organizations, and for the folks listening and watching in the Bay Area, Saturday, May 28th, we are having our first in-person hybrid listening session in Oakland, Saturday, May 28th, Saturday, May 28th, 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. at the California Ballroom. Dr. Brown, I think you're going to get a direct invite also to be one of the attendees also, I may be speaking ahead of my group here, but uh, that's what I heard. Uh, and then finally, I wanna talk about quickly AB 1604, AB 1604, which is a piece of legislation that our team has written language in, authored by Assembly Member Christopher Holden, that would for the first time ever in section two, create a category of data collection for black folks who descend from US slavery. 
we do not right now have anywhere in the state, in any city where we can go and say, hey, tell me how many black folks who descend from US slavery are in your city or in this state. And so AB 1604 would do that. This would be the first state in the country, I think, that actually has that language. So I'm encouraging the task force to support that. It's a shame that after 400 years, we don't have a name. After 400 years, we do not have a name. And that is a shame. We have been invisible as a people. That's also why your vote last month for lineage-based reparations eligibility was so important to us because it actually finally said that y'all see us, that we are seen. So thank you and have a great meeting. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Malcolm Gisson. I am the co-founder and co-leader of the San Francisco Black and Jewish Unity Coalition. This is an organization that was founded by black and Jewish clergy in 2016. Can you come closer to the mic? To turn it up, yeah, thank you. In 2016, to address issues of racism and inequity in San Francisco and the Bay Area. <clears throat> Many of us, <clears throat> had a hard time believing how much inequity there was in our progressive city. But as we've worked in areas of healthcare, housing, criminal justice, and economic opportunities, we have come to know that there is racism throughout our state and that it is time for reparations to be paid on a local, state, and national level to our black brothers and sisters. I wanted to address two of the issues related to this. I have the unique experience as a young man of having lived and worked as a civil rights worker in Mississippi. I lived with a black family who gave up everything to protect me, as did the black community. And as a white man, I had the unique experience of only feeling comfortable around black people and feeling very uncomfortable around whites who were constantly trying to kill me. Those feelings have lasted a lifetime, so I have devoted a lot of my life to trying to make the field equal, an equal playing field for everybody. And that's one reason why I've been very involved the last five years in criminal justice and prison and reentry reform. I retired after visiting San Quentin prison 13 times in two years and realizing the racism that exists in our criminal justice system and in our prison, prisons. And it was a, a very, a, <clears throat> very obvious to me that if we spend the money to greet everybody who gets to prison and tell them that everything we're going to do is to try to rehabilitate them so that they can have a good life after prison by establishing in every prison reentry offices where we can devote all of our energy to helping every incarcerated person in California prepare for life after prison. Every person in prison should be working with formerly incarcerated people to help them prepare for life after prison. We should have peer navigators, formerly incarcerated people who work with every incarcerated person to get them housing, to get them jobs, to get them psychological care, any addiction issues should be addressed. We're not doing that, and it's a simple solution if we were able to do that and spend the money to help our incarcerated brothers and sisters prepare for a successful life with a good job and a good house when they get discharged from prison. Hopefully the legislature will continue to address these issues because they're paramount if we want to change what we discussed yesterday, the school to prison pipeline, which is a disgrace and has Excuse to stop. Excuse me. I'm so sorry your time is up. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for listening. As, as you can see, I'm very <laughs> passionate about these things. Yeah, speak into the mic. Come, come. Onto the mic. Good morning, my name is Elaine Samuels. I'm a retired nurse. I'm 70 years old, and I'm glad this 
committee whose board is present. I've found 13 generations of my family. On one side, I've found many from actually 19, I'm sorry, 18. And we can go all the way across Europe, all the way to the United States. So I am grateful to have this committee present because I have found my relatives, all of them. And I'm here to represent them and their hard work to bring me to this present day. There were slaves in this country. They worked hard. They, they went through the Jim Crow, the whole gambit. And I'm glad you're here to make some kind of reparations for them because they made it possible for me to be here. And I thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, my name is Ramel Lamar L. I was here yesterday and I just want to give honors to the task force and also to acknowledge that even though it's not a lot of people physically here, it seemed like a good um, representation. It, this, it does seem like it's more people from like Southern California. That voice is very strong. The Bay Area, you know, it's kind of represented. Still a question about the Central Valley. But, um, you know, I still want to kind of talk about a few things within the time period. I'm a school teacher. I teach high school. I teach mathematics. I teach mathematics in my mother language, my mother tongue, which is not English. And yes, I am a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm born in California. My, my, my mom is the first one in California. Everybody before her is uh, Arkansas, Mississippi via South Carolina. So the language that I speak is the same language that the youth that I uh, teach in the Bay Area speak. And this language uh, has many names and it's not a uh, black English because English is not our first language. That's a whole other conversation. But what I would like to do is also talk about how my, my rights and a lot of the rights that we uh, campaign for is to promote the usage of um, African languages in uh, California. And it starts with our work. And what I would like to do again on behalf of the Moore's Divine National Movement in North America is read Act 6 of our Divine Constitution and Bylaws. This uh, organization represents the first um, Islamic religious society in North America established by so-called Negroes or descendants of, Afri of African slavery. And uh, Act 6 says, with us, all members must proclaim their nationality and we are teaching our people their nationality and their divine creed, that they may know that they are part and partial of this said government and know that they are not Negroes, colored folks, black people, or Ethiopians, because these names were given to slaves by slaveholders in 1779 and lasted until 1865 during the time of slavery. But this is a new era of time now, and all men now must proclaim their free national name to be recognized by the government in which they live and the nations of the earth. This is the reason why Allah, the great God of the universe, ordained noble Drew Ali, the prophet, to redeem his people from their sinful ways. The Moorish Americans are the descendants of the ancient Moabites whom inhabited the northwestern and southwestern shores of Africa. And I just read that because, oh, thank you. No, thank you. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Hope all this, everyone is doing well. Thank you, Task Force. Thank you, DOJ. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for having this wonderful hearing today. And thank you for the media team up there somewhere. Um, I'll, I'd also like to thank my ancestors, because um, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. I'm a proud person of a descendant of chattel slavery here in the U.S. Uh, my name is Jamoya Glass. I represent you in the Mass Media Group. And I'm also a member of the Coalition for a Just and Equitable California. Uh, my partner and I, Kim Mims, we have over 50 years experience 
in media. And to be honest, I'm giving my perspective, covering it from a black American's perspective regarding reparations. We've been following the task force since its inception. And I can tell you right now, we are underfunded. We have no money at all by doing this, but we're doing it because somebody from the media, with our experience, needs to tell our story from our community. Don't have to be doing this, doing a lot of other things. I have 18 to 20 years of experience in entertainment. I could be out there doing other foolish stuff, but I'm here covering the task force. And since I've been involved in this process, unfortunately, we have not, I'm including the task force, I'm including the DOJ, I'm including everybody who's involved in getting this reparations movement out there that we have to do a better job. This is no joke, okay? We, people have been here for 400 years. We don't need to be, so thank you. Yep. Yes, we have one more minute? We have one minute. Appreciate that. So what I'm trying to say is, when we, when we understand who we are, where we come from, and where we need to go, we have to be very specific in what we're doing. And make sure that we're organized and following through with what we're doing. And as long as we continue with this effort, we'll be okay. But we have to do a better job in communicating. We have a segment on our channel, a the Mass Media Group, called Boots on the Ground. We've been to the community. In Sacramento, in Los Angeles, we asked people, hey, do you know about the reparations task force? They said, we have no idea what's going on with it. But do you have, do you know what's going on with reparations? No, and it's predominantly black people. And we asked other ethnicities too. So I just wanted to give you my perspective from boots on the ground, what we need to do and where we need to go. And in, in the mass media is gonna be in this fight. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Are there any other uh, speakers here at the facility today? Hearing none, we will move to our uh, phone callers. So good morning, Sean. Can you get the uh, callers ready or are they in the queue and ready to go? Yes, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have not done so already, please press one to zero. Once again, that's one to zero on your touch. Our first participant will from line number 25. Please go ahead. Good morning, Sarah Schwartz. My name is Dermot Schwartz. You know, I'll be here by creating that. This is Mr. Nicole Jack Schwartz, the economic team. Uh, California is the California's U.S. government, possible culprits, and if, like other states, they have some staff and rest of American freedom in this people keep action watch or of an enslaved you participate in a genocide order will be held accountable questions you should consider in the destruction of black people who just form the form is the free you participate a black family through the same place free black Act as an that all three branches of our federal oppression that harms blacks. That's it. These questions that we must those harms. With that said, free state and that California and others have participated in the participation. Secondly, I find it. Of the economist team are lacking when it comes to providing us to the descended community. Not urban. As I've stated before, 
not to pussyfoot around. They be bold with your recommendations. We'll support you on your bravery. <laughs> on the part, we all know that the historical are ultimately what have placed America today. The economic advantages, such as the greatest position, that we must consider a lineage from a statewide figure. Coach, I am sure I am speaking in it. When I say this, there as a model of federal reparations, statewide reparations. The consists of guarantees provide that that section that includes recognition and not not meet these standards patients program to address the IR. Yes, hello. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? You should keep your line as open. Please All right. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Dr. Tish Crawford, and I am a member of California Black Lineage Society and a part of CJAC. I want to thank you, Chairman Moore, for your strong leadership and management of the California Reparation Task Force, and happy belated birthday. Um, we're just really excited that you and have so much respect for what you have done to help manage this um, this great task. Um, and that comes with respect, and it should not be undermined by Joanne Sawyer, and I'll address that later. But I, my heart is so full of love, I just want to thank the task force again, deciding in favor of lineage-based Reparation eligibility, Senator Bradford, Montgomery Step, Vice President Chairman Brown, and your beautiful church that you have. It is so historic and lovely and is brought to us by ETM Media. And I also want to thank Dr. Jovan Scott once again and Chairman Moore. Really exciting. Um, we are against extending the task force um, time um, that was underhandedly introduced by Reggie Joint Sawyer. He did not um, form nor discuss extending the task force with the members. Um, he has um, voted to extend it, but I noticed the task force has not done that. Thank you very much. But it was very underhanded of what he did by not consulting with you as a group to move this forward, which really leads me to believe that there is some really underlining um, some really underlying analysis going on with that. Um, also, I, I really and truly just believe that it doesn't need to be extended anymore. And also, I want to express my displeasure for the um, firms that were, the communication firms that were voted by the task force, and they've been in place since November and December, and it has been a really lackluster, basically derelict of duty. Um, to the black community and really borders on fiduciary abuse. It's really horrible how they have not done anything really um, of substance. And that's why I believe they need to be immediately replaced. And I'm recommending ETM Media. We're looking at you guys right now today in that beautiful church through the stellar um, performance by ETM Media. So um, we really and truly need to be moving forward and these publication firms are definitely not in the best interest of the black community. Um, I also want to talk about in moving forward with the lineage-based discussion, um, we must have grants that allow the community of eligibility to move forward with getting documents. And I'm going to express that no one should be able to pay for that in California. California should pay for that. I'm so sorry. Your time is up. Next speaker, please. Thank you. Next, we go to line number 19. Please go ahead. 
Good morning, Task Force. This is Marcus Champion. I uh, wanted to first take the time to thank you for the work you've put in thus far, in particular, Chair Moore, Vice Chair Brown, Dr. Jovan Scott Lewis, Senator Bradford, and Councilwoman Monica Montgomery Stepp for maintaining a lineage standard and doing this the right way. This is a labor of love and justice. God sees it. Your community appreciates you, and I salute you from South Central Los Angeles. First, I want to demand that uh, Member Reggie Jones Sawyer withdraw AB 2296. The legislation was enter entered into the California legislature in secret, and it makes no sense. There is no need to extend the task force for the purpose of community education. This, in my opinion, is a waste of the task force time, a waste of the state dollars, and ultimately an action that lacks optimization due to Bagley King. I wanted to speak about the necessity of competent and proactive communication. We are a few weeks away from the anniversary of this monumental task force, and the awareness within the state is still almost non-existent. Those of us citizens who make up CJEC have been doing our part on our own dime to spread awareness and information related to AB 3121 from the time it began moving through the California legislature. We are a ragtag bunch, but we move like giants. And what we have managed to do so far would seem impossible. But with that being said, it is long overdue that companies with the expertise and experience in this arena take the advertisement to the next level. There needs to be radio ads, TV spots, paid social media advertisement campaigns, et cetera, to make sure the American freedmen population across California know this reparations task force is happening. It is my hope during the proposal period that a state office similar to the Office of Redress Administration that was made uh, similar to what was made for the Japanese redress is created to handle eligibility. But until that happens, the American freedmen population in the state needs to be made aware they can begin their own family lineage journey. We all understand that our ancestors came through slavery, but to see the specific names and dates when they live is a level of pride and love that can't quite be described. When you have read books like The Haves Never Been Told, Slavery by Another Name, Slavery's Capitalism, etc., and get a greater understanding in detail of what these relatives who share my blood and DNA had to endure, persevere through, and ultimately overcame, you realize that superheroes have walked this earth, and I walk in their footsteps. Once again, happy birthday, Chair Moore. Thank you for your work, Task Force, and continue to persevere. Thank you. Next, we'll go to line number 20. Please go ahead. Line number 20, your line is open. I believe that, that's me. <laughs> um, Good morning, uh, Task Force. This is my um, first time uh, calling in and being, being able to speak. I would have been there in person, but uh, when I checked online, it said you had to be vaccinated only, and I'm not vaccinated, so I wasn't able to attend in person. Um, but the reason why, um, the reason for my comment is I'm a California native, um, my father is a California native, and my grandfather came here from Georgia. Um, he was in the Navy back in World War II, and he came here um, for better opportunities, for a better life. Um, the thing is, is that even though he came from Georgia and he was in the Navy and he moved out here and started a family, he still experienced racism. I remember the story that my father told me that he was chased out of school, um, Pinole High. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Pinole High School, but um, in the late 60s, my father was chased out of school by a bunch of um, white high schoolers calling him the N-word, um, calling him a monkey. And he said he ran as far as he could um, until he, he, could, he didn't see them anymore. And as far as my grandfather, um, I, I do want to mention I am half black and Mexican. My mom is Mexican American and my father is black. My father's father is black. My father's father's father is black. Um, and even though my grandfather died of dementia, um, I'm not, not dementia, but he died of complications and he had dementia when he passed. He couldn't remember, you know, a doctor's appointment for, you know, a doctor's appointment the next day. But he remembered 
being in World War II. He remembered the racism he experienced. He, he remembered um, being in California and still experiencing racism, experiencing it in the Navy, being forced to be um, a, a cook was what they called it. Um, because he he wasn't regarded as um, being as important to actually be be out on the field, so to speak. Um, and so I just I say I mentioned my grandfather because he left such an impression on me as a 12 year old child, just hearing his stories and the things that he went through. And I want to you know pay homage to him because he's no longer. Excuse me for interrupting you in the middle of your sentence, but your three minutes are up. But thank you so much. Next, we we'll go to line number five. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, this is Angela Nirvana, the reparationist perspective. Thank you to all of those tuning in right now. The National Urban League released its annual report on the state of Black America just two days ago, Tuesday, and its findings are grim. This year's Equality Index shows Black people still get only 73.9% of the American pie white people enjoy. These numbers change so little, uh, says Mark Morial. These numbers change so little and so slowly. What it tells me is that this institutional disparity based on race seems to be built into American society. In that area of wealth, we've seen almost no change, none since the civil rights days. The wealth disparity has gotten wider. I don't wanna hear about the plight of immigrants who chose to migrate here in Freedman Reparations Task Force hearings. Dr. Darity, I don't want to hear that the fifth largest economy in the world doesn't have the money to repair Friedman, especially given your contribution to the 2016 Color Wealth LA report, which states Friedman were $200 liquid pre-pandemic eight years ago. I don't wanna hear that the people who were harmed are no longer in the state after being legislated out of the state, down from 17 to 3%. There are 2 million of us still here hanging on by a thread with a median income of 40,000 and a median home price of 800,000 and the highest rates of homelessness, incarceration, foster care, unemployment and underemployment. I don't wanna hear you intend to use our reparations to close an over 100 trillions of dollars egregious racial wealth gap goal attained from our ancestors' heinous chattel slavery, which built the U.S. economy with $14 trillion. Even the mayor's consortium agrees with Thomas Kramer's number, $6.2 quadrillion, and that doesn't even include Jim Crow and accrued ongoing systemic racism, oppression, and disadvantage, and our never-ending Holocaust. We the people don't mind state and federal repair deposited monthly into our account akin to what the feds did for all Americans, which don't fix treatment during the pandemic, which uh, while excluding far too many treatment, given that we're over 50% of the homeless population. Mr. Joe Sawyer, I don't have time while in court to listen to 50 bills to vote no on your backdoor bill to extend the time of our study until 24. We are out of time. In closing, if Palm Springs can award transgender, transgenders $900 per month, the damages for what California continues to legislate from freedom, directly and indirectly, can be calculated and deposited monthly into the accounts of those who were driven from here and for those who remain for a specified number of years will take grants too. Absolutely no loan. That's my time. Thank you, Sean. We're going to pause for it at the end, Sean. Yes, please go ahead. Oh, hi. Hi, my name is Edie Mustafa. Uh, I'm calling from California. I wanted to, to first say, as part of the reparations uh, package to offset white supremacy, uh, I would like to ask, is it possible for us to do a mandatory hiring uh, in the law enforcement for black men and women to, uh, to offset this racism in the police departments? Uh, based on lineage, 
Uh, these black men and women will come in and uh, over the 18,000 police departments that we have be able to um, stop most of this qualified immunity, uh, give jobs to, to the black community and uh, balance off this racism in these departments and also make uh, the lineage based uh, uh, blacks uh, a protected class where these district attorneys and these judges uh, and the police departments cannot seize uh, the reparations that we get, make it kind of like social security where certain, only certain departments can uh, attach the money. So uh, that's what I'm asking, if we can uh, get into some type of law enforcement and uh, black, black men and black women and uh, offset some of these white supremacists in the police departments, whether it be sheriffs, highway patrol, LAPD, uh, across California and make this a model. And this will slow down some of this qualified immunity uh, that these whites have in these police departments. Also, if we can put them on the district attorney and the judges uh, departments, make this mandatory uh, as, as part of the reparations package and also tangibles uh, for the descendants of slaves. And uh, thank you, and thank you, um, uh, Dr. Weber. She really understands what we're going through when she made the statement that she doesn't want to see people cut over the line in front of uh, black people like it has always been. So I thank her for saying that. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's it. That's all I have to say. Thank you for listening. Next, we'll go to line number seven. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, hi, first my name is uh, Phoenix Starr. I'd like to thank uh, Madam Chair Moore, Co-Chair Brown, Ms. Montgomery Stepp, Senator Bradford, and a super thank you to uh, Professor Jovan Lewis for initiating the lineage-based reparations. My question now is will task force members voting against lineage-based reparations fight wholeheartedly for our monetary and land repair. For clarity, we are seeking tangible monetary compensation. No more studies are needed. We have been studied for the past century. California provides billions of dollars to sanctuary cities for illegal immigrants and free COVID relief to anyone who applies without scrutiny. Yet Dr. Darity says California cannot repair Freedmen. Freedmen have not left the state we are here, Dr. Darity. Dr. Grill, where is the work from the million dollar communication firm contract? Who have, who have they communicated with? Where is the website and social media presence? Nine months. We ask that the contract is transferred to anchor organizations that are ready to communicate and report to Friedman. The communications firms have nothing to show for nine months of monetary payments, which is an epic fail. Underestimating us, we are Freedmen, the ones who built this country, the current descendants that bring all the style and swagger to this nation. The spirits of our ancestors are here. Reggie Jones Sawyer, who you are working against us, initiating motions to extend AB 3121 without the vote and consent of the other task force members. The people want you to withdraw that initiative. No more double talking, Mr. Dunsweyer. Freedmen do not need more intellectual babble and studies. We need monetary compensation. This is what all of the studies have concluded over the past hundred years. So I must question the intentions of grill holders, John Sawyer, John Sawyer and Tamaki. At Mr. Tamaki, compensation will prevent repetition. All ethnic, minor, all ethnic and minority groups in America and California have been able to tether themselves to our civil rights. The fact that our ancestors built, built this country through forced labor and robbing of our intellectual properties and inventions, we are long overdue for our exclusive repair. The fact that we've been terrorized for hundreds of years, forced off our lands via eminent domain, the great migration, AKA the, the great land grab, which has played a role in our denigration of generational wealth, we are long overdue for our exclusive repair. Oh, then we have CIA-based COINTELPRO, the King Alfred Pratt, crack cocaine, mass incarceration, plans to, debt, to design to, debt, 
subjugate and destroy the indigenous freedmen in California and America. We are long overdue for our exclusive repair. Fortunately, you were not a part of these evil agendas for the U.S. and California governments of the past, so do not tether yourselves to our repair. Respe respectfully, I say to groups that truly want to ally with us with righteousness, we appreciate your support and honor. Thank you so much. I yield. Next to line number 32, please go ahead. Thank you. I am United States Air Force Master Sergeant Retired Cleve Millett, and I want to discuss two things, the state harms reparations model and discuss people who have already died. First, I would ask uh, the reparations board to discard and not use the state harms reparations model because that model allows the state of California to benefit from resources that were derived from slavery without being held responsible for the full, without being held liable for the full, um, for the harm, basically is what I'm saying. And, and my point is that when the state joined the federal system, I think it was in 1850, the state then became a subsidiary of the federal government. And the federal government made resources available to the state. Those resources that were made available came from the full breadth of harm from slavery. That's where the federal government got those resources to offer to the state. So the state as a subsidiary should be held just as responsible as fully responsible as the federal government would be. Uh, to do otherwise would be allowing the state to say, well, I didn't own any slaves, but the state benefited from slavery because of, the, because of being a subsidiary of the federal government. The next thing, so, so please don't use the state harm-based model, throw that out. Just make it purely, if you can trace your lineage to uh, slavery, then you get the full breadth of uh, reparations. Next, people who have already died. Uh, we must award each person who's already died, they also must be awarded a reparation. Because if we don't award them a reparation, then we're going to be legitimizing genocide and we're going to be legitimizing the slow wheels of justice as ways to deny reparations to people who've already died. So not only to people who've already died, but people who have been thus suffered the ultimate harm from slavery uh, to die without being, you know, repaired. So, each individual who, who, who's already died should also be added to reparations, be given the reparations. Now, for those people who've died and they don't have descendants, uh, that there, I, I would recommend that their reparation be put in a fund that could be used to ensure the dignity of elderly uh, people. Excuse me, sir. Your time is up. In three minutes, thank you so much for your comments today. Next, we'll go to line number 14. Please go ahead. Line 14, your line is open. Oh, hello. Can I be heard clearly? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so I couldn't be there today, but um, if this task force was built, to service the black community as, a, uh, as the descendants of slaves in, in, uh, in deserve of repair. I kind of uh, gauge the seriousness based on how well they keep the black community in mind. And so far, I don't think I'm 100% impressed. Um, starting with some of the models that w were in discussion yesterday, I'm not really sure that I understood all of it, but um, if I got the gist of it correct, um, if we are in under, uh, if we're, it's understood that California doesn't have a purse big enough to pay the, the bill for reparations, 
then isn't the charge here twofold? Develop a report that catalogs all the constitutional and human rights violations that occurred between slavery and today, and what happened, who did it, where it occurred, who were the victims, and government compliance or lack of protection, which produced the wealth gap. Then the economist would come in and start attaching dollar amounts to all of those atrocities and control for uh, inflation and then produce a, 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 a figure which would then be passed on to uh, Governor Newsom so that he can do a federal campaign for reparations program. Um, and to the extent that California can do something, it's push for legislation that makes ADOS a protected class through a set of black agenda items. Um, and so, I, like, I really need that part of the discussion from yesterday explained very clearly. And then also to wrap up, there were just some things last month that I heard from Lisa Holder where she almost tried to pull the task force away from the community that it, it was built to serve us. Uh, she kept on saying that it's our responsibility, our responsibility, as if she has been given unanimous control over the decisions that come from this task force without incorporating the ideas of the people. And I think that that, that logic is dangerous. We've all been doing work in order to see this task force through, and I don't think that that's a, a, a hospitable uh, mindset to have. I think that she needs to be gone. I would love for Michael Newman to give a clear set of instructions for how we could uh, start a removal process for Lisa Holder. And then also for these continuances from Joan Sawyer, who's asking for them? And can he explain why, is, why he's pushing for it? Because at this point, it's starting to look like you know, he's upset and bitter about the decision for lineage based reparations claim. And so now he plans on turning this into a long standing study that nothing ever comes out. And, you know, I'm so sorry. Your time is up. It's been three minutes. Thank you for your comments. Next, we go to line number 21. Please go ahead. Huh? It's line 21, you are live, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Brooke Sinclair, former resident of Redondo Beach, and I was absolutely disgusted to learn yesterday that included with our 40 acres and a mule was the sovereignty, the right to be a sovereign nation separate from the United States of America. I understand this now to be the base root of the so-called equal but separate Jim Crow which leads me to finally understand that we, a black Americans, do not need America. We don't need America's crusty schools. We don't need America's busted police system. And we, we can police ourselves. The United States government is a sadistic, raping bunch of pedophiles. No wonder white people don't want their children to know the truth. Dear Department of Justice, don't you ever again disrespect black Americans by coming to these proceedings unprepared and with your cocky ass attitude. How dare you fix your mouth to include your mediocre opinions on our business. And in conclusion, I'd like to say, dear Department of Justice and federal government, we don't want to live near you. Give us our money and leave us the fuck alone. Go fuck yourself. Thank you. Next, go to line number 11. Please go ahead. Um, thank you, Reverend Dr. Amos Brown, for hosting and bringing this work into the house of faith, where the community can all come together as one. Uh, my name is Dennis Hudson, and I want to apologize for not being with you in person uh, because I am observing Holy Week myself. As a pastor of the Lemoore United Methodist and Armonia United Methodist Churches, <clears throat> I am hosting services. Now, uh, thank you to the chairperson Moore uh, and the entire staff, the consultants, and members of the task force, and in particular to Senator Bradford uh, for the stellar work uh, here and in California legislature brought this work to our attention uh, through the testimony of our friend, brother, colleague, Damon Goodman of South Los Angeles, who is himself a descendant of a former slave, Colonel Allen Allensworth. 
Colonel Allensworth came to California after emancipation and becoming the first black colonel uh, in the U.S. Army. Uh, with other black descendants, uh, families uh, founded the town of Allensworth in the Central Valley, uh, which my family and I are now in the process with community of revitalizing after it was systemically uh, destroyed following Colonel Allensworth's untimely death uh, by racist practices, poisoning of the water, and removing the railway, uh, just are three examples. In 1974, members of the California NAACP and other black organizations formed a committee with a series of public meetings to establish the charter of the Colonel Allensworth State Historic Park, purchasing some of the acreage adjacent to the town. My twin sister, Denise Kadar, and our family, we are following in the footsteps of our mother, Nettie Morrison, who hailed from Los Angeles by way of Denison, Texas. Uh, she worked 40, for 40 plus years to rectify the damage of economic, environmental, and community destruction. Now, I, one day I was visiting my mother and I was in the car with my twin sister, Denise, and her husband, Coyote, and we were driving. And I, as I saw the town, it was still looking deprived and, and desperate. And I thought to myself, why doesn't somebody do something? Why doesn't the government do something? And this voice within me spoke and said, why don't you do something? And from that point on, I have been working, investing to uh, improve the conditions of uh, Allen's work. Uh, we were excited to learn of the Senate Bill of 1277, which established in the California legislature earlier this year, called uh, for the California legislature to work together to support the vision of Colonel Allen Allen's work to create a community built on capacity, resilience, and African American liberation, and to enact. Excuse me, sir. I'm so sorry to cut you off in the middle of your sentence, but your time is up. And Sean, this will be our last call-in speaker today. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker will come to the line of line number 23. Please go ahead. Once again, that's line 23. Thank you. Good morning, Task Force. I'm a concerned descendant of American chattel slavery, and I'm calling to go on record uh, with support for my brothers and sisters there in California. I'd like to thank Chair Camilla Moore for her leadership uh, in managing the uh, task force and uh, to wish her also a happy belated birthday. I'd also like to thank the task force members who have uh, chosen to vote for the lineage-based reparations uh, eligibility standard. I'd also like to express um, oppositions to the um, bill AB 2296 introduced by member Reggie Jones Sawyer and asked that it be withdrawn. Um, I don't believe that it is like other people have stated before me necessary to stretch the um, task force uh, time of consideration another uh, year out uh, from the current time. Uh, and the last thing I'd like to add is um, I'd like to express displeasure with the communications firm. I only get uh, information about what's going on in California through uh, social media networks that have been uh, provided through channels uh, like ETM, for example, and, and CJEC. Uh, so I would uh, appreciate if those black grassroots media organizations could be included uh, since it appears that the uh, communications firm is um, somehow using this as a money grab. Uh, and not uh, fulfilling their duty in terms of communicating uh, this uh, monumental and uh, historic uh, event that's happening in California. Thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes our in-person, our call-in uh, speakers today. And we have one more in-person speaker. Will you please come forward? Chair Moore, was that the individual? We, we have what? Oh, three more. Three more. Three, three more. more? Okay, please come forward. 
you may begin. Good morning. My name is Samuel Nathaniel Brown. I am um, the co-founder of the Anti-Violence Safety and Accountability Project, along with my wife, Jamelia Land. I'm also the co-chair of the California Abolition Act Coalition, um, ACA3, which seeks to end slavery and involuntary servitude here in California prisons once and for all. And it was in a piece of legislation that I was fortunate to write while I was still incarcerated prior to my release. So I've been out of prison for about 100 days. I did 24 years. And per encouragement of my wife, I wrote the legislation and then Senator Sidney Com Sydney Com Lager picked it up and backed it. And so it's an honor to be here today in support of this legislation because it runs hand in hand with ACA3. And we thank you all for supporting ACA3 and our entire coalition stands behind you. And reparations is overdue. You know, when we talk about mass incarceration or the overarching political systems, the social, economic, um, educational, legal systems, we see that this transgenerational trauma that permeates all the way from 1619 is still running rampant in our communities today. So if we want to have any opportunity to level the playing field, then the reparations are definitely needed. So I just want to say thank you to Chair Camilla Moore, Senator Bradford, and all you all for the work that you're doing and know that us in the California Abolition Act Coalition are firmly behind you and anything that we can do to get this legislation passed, we're totally engaged. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next speaker. Hello, my name is Kamji Ansley, um, born and raised in San Francisco, California. Um, I am the great, great, great granddaughter of Archie Townsend, and I speak for him, born in 1821 in Alabama. Between 1808 and 1860, the enslaved population of Alabama grew from less than 40,000 to 435,000. Alabama had one of the largest enslaved populations at the start of the Civil War. The United States government is charged with sex trafficking, child molestation, kidnapping, harboring fugitives, harboring criminals, and theft. Archie is the father of Catherine, born in 1835 in Alabama. She is the mother of Catherine, born July 4th, 1875, and died in 1949. She lived through Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877. She lived through the failures of what the 13th and the 14th and the 15th Amendment was supposed to do for her family. She lived through the destruction and the thievery of the Freedmen Break with the assistance of the United States government. She lived through Jim Crow, 1877 to 1865, and she died during Jim Crow. Her child was Ethel Amanda, born in 1899. Her child was Catherine. Her child was Mary Catherine, born in 1827, 1927, who was a member of this church since its inception. She made it to California running from domestic terrorism, supported by the United States government, and wound up in Los Angeles after graduating from Prairie View, Texas. Fighting for the rights of women underpaid in Los Angeles, she was going to be lynched the following day and was smuggled to San Francisco, California, where my father Vincent was born and where I was born. I'm talking for them through lineage, through heritage, for a debt that is old. Thank you for your comments this morning. Next speaker, please. Hi there. My name is Michael James Satchel. My father. Uh, my name is Michael James Satchel. My father was the Reverend A.T. Satchel. He was a Pentecostal minister. 
uh, my family moved from Fresno, California, where I was born, to San Francisco in 1951. Uh, my father owned property, uh, apartment building on Hayes between Fillmore and Steiner, so I know the history from 51, I'm, well, I was a baby then, but let's just say from the 50s to the present in this city. Uh, I passed Third Baptist many times on Sundays when it was so full, the people were just stacked outside. There's a couple of things I wanted to represent because I don't know the overall of what your panel has done or what you've laid down, but these are the things that I see that needs to be addressed. First of all, the word African American. When you say the word African American related to the indigenous people of this land, a person from the continent of Africa who is Chinese, who is Caucasian, or who is African, when they arrive in the United States and become a citizen, can claim themselves to be African American. And some can even say they're more African American than most. So I think that word needs to be eliminated from this discussion of reparations. The next thing that I like to say is that this is a state uh, project that is being initiated by you people, honorable people. But my concern is that, is it going to affect the national campaign? Because we're asking, not we are asking, but there has been uh, put out that we're asking for $20 trillion. Now, we want tangibles. Our history has been clearly laid out by this wonderful lady here, and I'm sure you know it. But I feel that this panel may be trivializing repar reparations in the fact that the, the things that you're talking about, giving to the um, displaced people or the uh, misabused people of the indigenous or um, uh, descendants of slaves, are like sidebar stuff. It don't amount to nothing. You're almost telling us, we want to give you some tickets to the Warriors basketball game. We want to give you all these trivial things. What we really need is tangibles. We need funds, money, and we need land. The money was taken from us. Now, my family... Excuse both, me, sir. I'm so sorry to cut But my you three off. minutes are up. Yes. So in, in parting, I want to say this. If this committee is derailing the national committee for us to get... $70 trillion, you need to disband and get out of our way because we are not coming for tidbits. Our people built this nation. And let me just say something else, and I know you're not going to like it. We are giving millions of dollars to the Ukrainians. I walk two blocks out my house, there's homeless people, black people who are descendants. I'm from Fillmore. I know the history. UN passed a, a memo around saying that African-American UN citizens serving in Poland and Ukraine Sir, I'm have so sorry. to Your time is are up. being called niggers we have and to be monkeys. Fair to everyone. And we're giving millions to those people and nothing to the homeless out Thank here. Thank you, but you guys need to either de deliver the money or get out of the here. way. Your time is up. Thank you. Thanks for coming out today. This is our last speaker of the public comment period this morning. Good morning, thank you, and please I, speak. Good morning, my name is Lavier Foster, and I represent the African American Community Service Agency. We're a nonprofit located in San Jose, down in Santa Clara County. And a lot of the work we do is to help provide for, for our people, people who don't have enough resources to, to get to work, to provide for their families, to live. So we just want to say that we're grateful for the work that you're doing. We do a lot to promote reparations on what's happening nationally and engage in our community and informing on what can be done. And it's really important to understand that it's not just like what can get someone to the next day, but how do we build wealth in our community so that we can own land, have an education, and sustain generational wealth for a long time to come. So again, I just want to thank you for the work that you do. And remember that we do have a community, 
even down in San Jose who's paying attention to what you're doing and can really be a resource or promote to our community in any way we can. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our public comments this morning. And again, thank you everyone uh, for coming out. We invite you to, to attend future public meetings or to submit written comments or testimony via email at reparationstaskforce at doj.ca.gov. I will now turn the mic back over to Chair Moore. Thank you. So before we go to agenda item number 15, I'll turn to Vice Chair Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the task force. Ladies and gentlemen, I beg this personal privilege to pastorally, lovingly, and respectfully call to our attention that during this process, we as black folk should not and must not let others define what we are about. Secondly, I appeal to you to not let that boogeyman be created by the media that black folks are not interested in reparations. Number three, don't assume fallaciously that numbers always count. Thank God that I'm a historian and I have the facts. Only 3% 3%, 3%, I say, of the black church, black preachers were involved in the civil rights movement. And this is documented by the Joint Center for Political Studies in Washington, DC. And in my home state of Mississippi, Back in 1959, a survey was taken. Only four churches in Jackson opened their doors to Dr. King, Mega Evans, and others. They were scared. Or they had been co-opted by those racist white evangelicals who said that the preachers had no business being involved out in the world. Finally, yes, there's one room that's never filled and that's the room for improvement. We are all flawed people trying to help the flawed. And we need to stop pointing fingers. Mama told me in Mississippi, when you point fingers, it's always more pointing back to you. And we must keep in mind that we are a quality folk. It's not always Quantity is quality. And you have been, as members of this task force, quality. Erudition, excellence, and you about empowering a people. And for such a time as this, God has permitted us to speak truth to the evil powers of this nation, this state, and this world who don't like us because our skin is black. Aristotle said it during the fourth century BC. 
the Ethiopian or the black man or inferior. And he said in his work, the politics. And secondly, he said, we will never be capable of self-governance. We would always have to have the white man or the white woman over us. And that's the reason why number 45 uttered that ignorance that Africa was an asshole because it knew not respect our humanity. Finally, practically, numerically, in this sanctuary, we are here where two or three are gathered together in the name of justice, love, and equality. The divine one of the universe will fight our battles and we're going to have victory. There's a requirement for vaccinations and let's face it, let's face it, there's still many of us who erroneously are not trusting and respecting science, who are not vaccinated. Third Baptist Church, this historic church, has always followed common sense science and been on the side of liberation. And I can say humbly that during these two years of this evil pandemic, we have not lost one member to COVID-19. Not a one. It's because of the grace of God and because we have tested, we have vaccinated, and we will continue to do it. And we know, we know we're on the right side of history and you are on the right side of history. And in this town right now, you see, we got so many demons to deal with, so many evils to fight. During this entire week, what is happening in the so-called city of St. Francis? There has been a so-called redistricting committee of this city. And for the last two weeks, what has been happening? They are attempting to gerrymander the black community out of San Francisco in districts five and 10. So our troops have been divided, fighting on every front. Thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me this personal privilege, but I think we need to stop beating ourselves up about the crowd is not here. We got a crowd, a number that likened to that of John's number that he saw on the Isle of Patmos, number that could not be numbered. Our cause is just, it's right, and there will be results and outcome if we just stay focused and keep our eyes on the prize of America paying up for all the evil and the dirt that they've done to black folk in this nation. Thank you. Madam Chair, before you proceed, I'd like to raise a point of information. Uh, with respect to the attendees, um, the task force attendees. I want the record to reflect that member Holder came in and is present. And also I'd like to determine whether or not member Joan Sawyer is present on the phone. Yes. I'm he, not. he is. M member Reggie Joan Sawyer, are you present? Hello. Thank you. Then please let the record reflect that member jo Joan Sawyer is present by phone. Thank you. The record will reflect that Lisa Holder is here and member Reggie Joan Sawyer is here by phone. So we'll now move to agenda item number Thank 15, you. which is a final discussion and vote on report one uh, presented by C. Yuen Yang, who I believe is on the phone, and attorney Newman. Uh, I'm sorry. I did not 
note that uh, member uh, Montgomery Step was also present. She came in after the roll was called. I, I did not ask her to. Yeah, she was here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. of the task force. It is uh, great to see everybody here. Um, okay, so I'm going to put it all the way up. Okay. Uh, members of the uh, task force, it is uh, my pleasure uh, to be up. able to present uh, back from, uh, oh, some feedback on the phone, I guess. If people on the phone could mute. If people on the phone could mute as Attorney Newman is presenting, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, members of the task force, members of the public. Um, as you have seen uh, in several um, back and forths uh, with the task force uh, and with the public, uh, we have presented uh, an outline of a report, then a draft of the report, and now we, have we are presenting to you, reflecting all of your edits edits and suggestions of your contracted experts, uh, inputting public comment, as well as expert testimony that you received over the course of your meetings, um, as well as uh, extensive site checking and review that continues even to, to this moment, I think, um, back in the DOJ, uh, a report for your consideration and vote and approval today. Um, I have with me, well, on the phone, Siyun Ye Young, who is the, uh, who has been handling uh, the lead of this, as well as Francisco Balderrama here in the room, who has been working with CUN, um, and our significant team that's been working through all the issues. Uh, we have um, a couple of different items for your consideration or maybe to structure the conversation. The first is you all have been providing us along the way a number of different edits, suggestions, commentaries on items that should be included, items that should be excluded, um, framing, uh, wording, things like that. Um, I feel it may make the most sense for us to first take up the question of if there are any remaining edits, suggestions, um, comments, high-level comments um, across the entirety of the report. And then the second uh, component that I think it makes sense to, to address are the extensive preliminary recommendations. Uh, as you know, AB 3121 includes a provision that the task force make preliminary recommendations based on the findings or makes recommendations. These are the recommendations that are key directly to the report's delineation of the harms, the intergenerational harms that took place over hundreds of years uh, in the United States and in California. The recommendations are general and they are keyed into those harms. These are separate from the broader recommendations that will be brought in in the second report that, and the topics you'll be addressing in the second phase of the task force's life, looking at the modes, eligibility, and operations of a reparations um, scheme that the legislature will eventually um, address uh, based on your recommendation. That's the broader recommendation. And then the third issue uh, to address are any sort of more macro questions about the report, uh, the, the organization, the forward, uh, laying it out, things of, those, of that nature. Um, and if that that's, meets your uh, approval as to how to proceed with the next couple of hours before lunch, um, we can go ahead and start by seeking your generalized input on uh, the report if there are any major topics that were missed or anything like that. Referee, Thank you. Um, it was suggestion, it suggested, I should say, that uh, there would be two member committee to review and uh, kind of like help uh, build the framework on what the final report should look like. Um, it is my suggestion that one, if not both of those members, be one of the legislature. 
And the reason I say that, it's key to having a final document that hopefully we can get passed uh, by the California legislature. So I think it would be critical to have uh, some individual uh, with that understanding of that working uh, process, reviewing that document so we could assure that it has its best chance of a success once it gets to both houses. So I would strongly suggest, not that I'm looking for more work to do, but I, I strongly suggest that one, if not both of those members be part of the legislature. And from the Department of Justice's uh, viewpoint, that's exactly right. I mean, we do think it's gonna be, there are gonna be some um, edits, hopefully minor, um, fo even following your, your approval um, for us to proceed with publication. Um, right now, like I said, we are doing site checking. There have been a couple more suggested edits. Um, and if we get to a point where there are some more, if anybody uh, on the task force has any more uh, significant substantive edits, we will need that kind of approval from a, from a group that's delegated that authority from the task force. Um, Department of Justice is not going to make any of those changes on its own, um, and we can only act at the direction of the task force as a whole. So we certainly would have we do recommend um, that going forward. I think we've mentioned that a couple of times. And so I think that makes a lot of sense, especially truly given that uh, it is a recommendation to the legislature. And, and we have the resources in our, to our staff and being able to uh, access legislative counsel too, to help us frame a, a document. That can be more eyes are always, uh, more eyes and more help are always welcome. Um, we suggest if that's uh, your recommendation that you make a motion um, for that to for that to take place. Member Grills. I'd like, I'd like to make a motion. Oh. I'd like to make a motion that our two um, representatives of the assembly and the senate serve as a subcommittee to review the final edits. Um, Advisory committee. Advisory committee. Second. It has been properly moved and seconded that the two um, elected officials on the task force, namely Senator Bradford and Assemblymember Reggie Jones Sawyer, comprise of a subcommittee to review the final edits of the report. Is there any discussion on the matter? Here. Hearing no further discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for roll call vote. Thank you. I'll begin with the chair's vote. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Brown? Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford? Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder? Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Joan Sawyer. Member Joan Sawyer. Aye. Member Joan Sawyer votes aye. Member Lewis. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Tamaki. Aye. Member, member Tamaki votes aye. Member Montgomery Step. Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Madam Chair, there were nine members voting. Of present in voting, and there were nine ayes and zero nays. Thank you. There are nine ayes and zero nays, and the ayes have it, and the motion passes. Is there any other high level comments um, related to the report? Member Tamaki, you're recognized. Well, the task force is charged with delivering a number of deliverables, and I think the report, um, I've read all 13 chapters, uh, is a huge contribution to the public. Um, I think every social movement that's made any difference needs a historical, intellectual, underpinning and analysis, and I think the report does that. Um, 
the fact that it's going to be finalized in or released in June, I think, is uh, to the task force's credit and uh, the Department of Justice uh, work in this. My understanding is that there's been 10 uh, attorneys uh, working on this and additional staffers, and I'd like to commend and thank each of them. Um, I think the report uh, will probably attract not only California publicity, but also will be looked upon uh, nationally. And there are at least 30 truth commissions uh, working in locales throughout the country that are dealing with exactly the same question that the task force is dealing with, but they don't have the resources that have been uh, committed by the state of California. And one of those is the deliverable uh, uh, the report, which uh, so many people have put an effort in. And the reason it's valuable is it synthesizes the latest research in some, in some cases this year and the past two or three years, um, and wraps that into a through line, which begins with the uh, enslavement, attracts it in every iteration of prejudice that is to follow, that explains really, uh, no surprise, the consequences that we have today, including what everybody has talked about, the racial wealth gap, leasing, discrimination in housing, segregated schools, and so on. And so I, I think it provides the, uh, the reasons uh, that we can go out to the public and begin to develop uh, allyship and, and support for this. So <clears throat> I just want to commend the uh, Department of Justice staff uh, for all of its work in this. And I think um, as part of the uh, report, uh, there should be an acknowledgement with the names of uh, the staffers that worked on this. And I also think that there should be an acknowledgement of all the witnesses who testified. So many of them are actually cited in the report. Um, and it includes personal narratives, both historically and presently. So I think it's important to cite those. those witnesses. So if that's um, if it's necessary to make a motion for that, uh, I'd certainly uh, move that um, the report incorporate acknowledgments of the DOJ contributions, the persons uh, uh, named. We'll leave it up to the DOJ to identify them, and also to uh, acknowledge the witnesses who testified. Second. It has been properly moved and seconded that the report includes an acknowledgement of the DOJ attorneys who contributed to the report and to the witnesses um, that provided personal and expert testimony that are mentioned in the report. Is there, is there, oh, sorry. Is there any discussion on the matter? I'll just add that it would be good for the report to also reflect the actual membership of the task force. I don't think anywhere in the report does it actually name the members. Any other discussion? Okay, you can move to amend if you like, Member Jovan Scott Lewis. For now, we'll go to Parliamentarian Johnson to cue a roll call vote on the motion that's on the floor. Thank you. I will begin the vote with Chair Moore. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Brown. Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford. Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills. Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder. Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Joan Sawyer. Member Joan Sawyer. Aye. Thank you. Member Lewis. Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member I said Jones. aye. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> um, member Tamaki. Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. And Member Montgomery Stepp. Aye. Member Montgomery Stepp votes aye. 
The total present in voting were nine. Madam Chair, there were nine members present in voting. There were nine ayes and zero nays. Thank you. There are nine ayes and zero nays, so the ayes have it, and the motion passes. I would just like to say um, thank you all very much uh, on behalf of the Department of Justice staff. I know it was a labor of love for uh, everybody who worked on it, and I also appreciate all of the incredible, incredible work done by all of you to, to member Lewis's point, uh, the work that all of you have done, the work that the community's done in giving input um, and producing really an incredible report, incredible record. So thank you all very much for your appreciation. I'd like to go to member Jovan Scott Lewis or defer to member Cruz. I mean, is it necessary to, to just add our names to the report that we're obviously a part of? Is that what you're trying to suggest? Yeah, I mean, unless we can do by I consensus. Mean, no, we, we've got your direction and we'll go ahead yeah, and include it. Okay, member girls, you recognize. make a recommendation to the task force that we apply a particular label to the report rather than calling it a report instead we call it an interim report um, and I say that for several reasons starting with the fact that we still have information coming in for example yesterday we just entertained um, expert witnesses expert witnesses <laughs> Um, expert witnesses to address education issues, which will need to be folded in. Secondly, we are launching all of these community listening sessions. What signal would we be sending to the community if, you know, that we have, you know, already issued a report of harms, but they're still detailing and providing testimony on those harms, uh, as well as their perspective on a number of other issues. So I think it would send an important signal to the community first and foremost that what they have to contribute does in fact matter. By calling it interim, we leave the door open to fold in some of the things that they will share over the next few months. And as we continue to detail the harms and, and you know, identify facts and points that we will then be able to fold those in as well. So I would like to make a motion that we identify this as an interim report. It's been properly moved and seconded that we identify this report as an interim report. Is there any discussion on the matter? Who seconded? Hearing no further discussion, we'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson to procure roll call vote. also have space limitations down here, it's not just up there. This is uh, Amendment C to item 15. I'll begin the vote with uh, Chair Moore. Aye. Vice Chair Brown. Aye. Member Bradford. Aye. Member Grills. Aye. Member Holder. Aye. Member Joan Sawyer. Member Joan Sawyer. I'll go back to him. Um, member Tamaki. Aye. Member Lewis. Aye. And member uh, Montgomery Step. Member uh, Joan Sawyer. Member Joan Sawyer. Okay. Okay. We'll count that. If anyone objects to that. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, there were nine members voting 
And uh, there were nine eyes, zero nays. Thank you. There are nine eyes and zero nays. The eyes have it and the motion passes. Any other high level comments about the report? Okay, if there are, thank you very much, Chair Moore. Um, if there are no other general comments, I think uh, the next, or, or edits, of course, you know, please let us know. Um, I think the next question is the list of recommendations. Um, as you all know, under AB 1321, um, 3121, uh, the um, report is to include not just this list of, of, of harms that have been, that have been done, but also recommendations for how to address those harms. And these are more um, high level policy recommendations for consideration for the legislature to rectify the harms that have been dele delineated. Um, the last draft of the report that we provided included harms at the end of each chapter. Uh, we are preliminary recommendations at the end of each chapter. Uh, we have worked to both incorporate the, the recommendations that you all provided us as well as to sort of pull out recommendations that are included in the research and incorporate the recommendations that were made by various experts that testified along the way. So in each meeting, we were pulling out those recommendations and including them. So this is a comprehensive list of a uh, comprehensive, the report is now comprehensive of all of those recommendations, um, which have been sort of framed in a way that it advances the rectification of these harms that happened. Um, you all have them. I wanted to create this space for us to, uh, if anybody has additional recommendations or items that they want to make sure are included as a recommendation, again, keyed to the harms that were done, um, we, we'd like to hear those. Um, if there are additional recommendations or, or high level recommendations, you know, those would also need to be voted on for inclusion um, in the report because you're voting to eventually you'll vote on whether to approve the report in the form that it's in that you've looked at. So if we're adding to that, we'll need to have motions on those specific recommendations. Maki, you recognize. Thank you, uh, Mr. Newman. So my understanding is the legislature, or, or the, the, the bill, AP 3121, requires recommendations in part one of the report. And secondly, my understanding is that the recommendations are preliminary in that they could be augmented, modified, added to part two of the final report. We're calling this one the interim report. So is that correct? That is correct. And the other way in which these recommendations can be utilized is assisting in, in creating the scope of work that the experts would then be looking at if you wanted to add costs or fiscal impact or anything like that, or, or have the experts for the second report, second or part two of the report, um, to incorporate that into their assessment as to the methodology of reparations, the costs and things like that. Um, so they, they all fit together. Um, but if there was anything that anybody wanted included now um, as part of that, we can include that now. But of course, based on the earlier vote, um, as a preliminary report, you'll have the opportunity in phase two to augment, modify, et cetera. You're exactly right. So the task force has the ability to modify, augment, enhance. So I, I would view them as sort of an evolving set of recommendations. And we have labeled them in the report already that you all have as preliminary recommendations. Any other comments or questions about the preliminary recommendations listed in the report? Member Girls, you're recognized. Process. There are 13 chapters and recommendations within each of those. Those are, um, I guess, to a great extent in the executive summary. Yes. 
So might it be helpful to go either chapter by chapter and see if there are any questions or um, comments about the recommendation or go through the executive summary so that the flow <coughs> to what we're doing as opposed to leapfrogging across chapters or across topics. You'd like, I can read them off, is that what you, you want me to no, read? No, I'm just saying in terms of a process, can we say, all right, we're going to look at the, you know, any recommendations in the introduction, any comments or questions about that? Moving on, chapter one, any comments, chapter two, just so that we have a kind of logical flow to discussing the recommendations. So, I, we, we deserve, we, whatever you want to do. So, Madam Chair, you can guide us through that. No problem. Um, yeah, before I do that, I wanted to just make some high-level comments about the report. And I know that as a new advisory committee, you can take this into account. Um, in the report, for instance, um, there's many references to racial terror. And I think we had a conversation about this, Attorney Newman, if you want to talk about the process in which um, edits were accepted and rejected or incorporated. But in numerous iterations of the report, I brought issue with the idea or term of racial terror, because I think it's a euphemism. It's similar to race riots, right? Um, for instance, in Tulsa, um, you know, in the past, people have called it a race riot, but now, colloquially, it's now considered a massacre. The Tulsa, what happened in Tulsa was not a riot. It was not something mutual. It was a massacre where white people um, massacred black people. Um, and so similarly with there's racial terror listed all throughout the report. And I think that is a euphemism. I think we should use white supremacist terror instead of racial terror. Because again, racial terror to me implies that there was this mutual exchange of terrorism or violence. And it discounts the historical truth that for 400 years, African-Americans who descend from chattel slavery in this country have been terrorized by white supremacists. Okay, but could you please um, point to the process in which edits were incorporated or rejected? Sure, uh, just generally speaking, um, the edits, you know, we serve the task force as a group of nine. So obviously, if you want to make a motion um, and direct that racial terror be shifted over to uh, white supremacist terror, um, and that's what the task force votes on, then we'll incorporate that edit. I, I think, by and large, our, in our evaluation of, of all of your edits, um, nine people, nine different um, perspectives and sets of edits, what we attempted to do, what, and in, cons in consultation with our, the experts that you all have retained for the purposes of generating this report, we attempted to utilize uh, the language, you know, more common language and language that um, is predominant in a lot of the uh, texts and literature and research on these issues, and also taking into account sometimes conflicting um, suggestions from the different members. So um, in all things, basically my answer to every one of the suggestions today is going to be make a motion and if there are a majority of votes, we will implement that edit throughout the entire report. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, you're recognized by Chair Brown. <laughs> Madam Chair, members of the task force, I hope the staff will keep in mind that if this document is to have structure and a solid frame. Reparations ought to be built around three words. Land, learning, and love. Land, learning, and love. Land. Originally, we were supposed to have gotten our 40 acres. It was snatched away from us. 
field order number 15 was not carried out. Fast forward, in the state of California specifically, gentrification, so-called urban renewal, was the destruction of that land factor. Begin to feel more. Now Central Los Angeles, 14th Street in Washington, D.C. Sweet Auburn Avenue in Atlanta, Georgia. This evil system has prevented us from having our just right to land. In 1900, we own about 19 million acres of land. But today it's less than 3 million. Black farmers have been crying about land. In San Francisco, we own much. Vernon Johns, who preceded Dr. Martin Luther King at Dexter Church, once said, if you want to see an example of perpetual motion, sell a Cadillac car to a Negro and tell him where to park it. Because there's no land, no driveway to park it in. Let's go on to learning. Oh, enslavement forbade us to even learn how to read and write. Higher education was not even available for us. But through all of that mess, there was a black preacher named John Barry Meacham, born into enslavement in Virginia, sold up to Kentucky. Family was torn asunder. But this man, John Barry Meacham, was a master carpenter. And when his enslavers finally took him up to St. Louis, Missouri, a state where it was against the law for a black person to even read or write. If they were caught reading or writing, they would be whipped many lashes. 1847, John Barry Meacham, this master carpenter built on a steamboat on the Mississippi River, a school. What did he do? He told the pilot, it's against the law for us to learn in St. Louis and Missouri. Pedal over to Illinois where there's a free state. When they got over to Illinois, one of the first students in that class was a person who founded Lincoln University, the first institution for higher education of blacks. Finally, another L is love. Love. What is love? Wanting the best for the beloved. Working for the best for the beloved. But America has not loved us. Think why they treat us as if we were two inanimate objects. To build the economy, to build the White House, to build Congress. And love us, but we've been faithful to America. We need love. When you love people, you respect their presence, the personal touch. 
our culture needs to be respected. We need to have our cultural enclaves where we can celebrate love for each other. Same as other people celebrate love for their history, their culture, their music, their art. Those three L's, if you stay true to them, you will make sure that this document takes on real meaning and people of fair minds and with a sense of justice, even in the state assembly, will find it difficult to vote against it. Thank you, Madam Chair, for that no preacher expound. But we keep those three L's in mind. We'll do all right. Land, learning, and love. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'll start by beginning at the executive summary and listing the preliminary recommendations in the executive summary, which is on page 0140. The task force recommends that the legislature consider legislation two, one, implement a comprehensive reparation scheme as will be detailed in the task force report two, establish an office of African-American Freedmen Affairs to address past harms and potential future harms and include an administrative arm to assist claimants in filing for eligibility. Establish an office of Freedmen Genealogy in order to support potential claimants with genealogical research and to confirm eligibility. Establish a reparations tribunal redress administration in order to adjudicate substantive claims for past harms. Establish an office of immediate relief to expedite claims on a case by case basis. Transmit the task force report and findings to the United States Congress and President with the recommendation that the federal government create a reparations commission for American freedmen through statute or executive action. Request that the federal government, potentially through the United States Office of Management and Budget, facilitate data disaggregation for black African racial groups on the federal level. And then lastly, enact legislation such as ACA 3 and AB 1604 that would advance the recommendations and findings of the task force. Are there any comments about the preliminary recommendations in the executive summary? Page 0140 and page Uh, just to be clear, uh, Chairman Moore, you're, mm -hmm. uh, Chairman Moore, you're talking about um, the page numbering in the executive summary, not in the individual chapters, right? It's the and it's the same information in the executive summary as in each of the individual chapters. Well, pages six and seven of the executive summary. Mm 
But there's more recommendations in the, in the individual chapters. Like there's additional recommendations that I didn't read yet in the, in the other chapters. I think that the executive summary includes oh, all okay. of the recommendations from each chapter. And what we did is in the executive summary, we give a breakdown of each of the chapters so people can just read the executive summary and get the high level of the report as a whole. That saves people from reading the 800, yeah. I think, mm -hmm. pages. <laughs> so in the so you could just read off of page like six and seven are the executive summary um, pages where the that you've just read those preliminary recommendations go to chapter one. Okay. So I mean, so should I just read the rest? Just keep going. You know, there's many, many to discuss. Okay. All right. So, so we'll start with chapter one, which is enslavement and the preliminary recommendations for enslavement. I just listed. So are there any comments or questions on the preliminary recommendations for chapter one, enslavement? Okay, so we can move forward with the preliminary recommendations for racial terror, chapter two. Um, and I was reading it for the audience who may not have the papers in front of them. Um, so that's really why I was reading them. But does anyone have any questions or comments on the preliminary recommendations for chapter two titled racial terror? Yes, the meeting materials are online. You can go to our website at oag.ca.gov forward slash AB3121. And the meeting materials are under is it meeting materials part one. And the entire report is in those meeting materials. I'll also add for those in the room, there is a QR code at the front of the, it went at the entrance. And if you just use your camera, click on the QR code or bring it up. That'll take you directly there. No, it's, it's pretty long. I'm just going to read them because there's a need from the audience to <laughs> learn. Yes. I, I would like to suggest that would be laborious and very much time consuming. I, I think that. We have this document, persons who want to consult it and do so. Let's deal with the basics and the substance, not the minutia. The plan that I gave those three L's, if we edit this, that would be the guidepost, that would be the structure, and they, they would be sensitive Stand on course. So I don't think that we should spend that the time to go through all, all this reading. Okay. So are there any comments or questions for the preliminary recommendations listed in Chapter 2 titled Racial Terror? Okay. Here are no comments or questions. We'll move on to Chapter 3 Political Disenfranchisement. Are there any comments or questions? for the preliminary recommendations listed in chapter three, political disenfranchisement. Yes, member um, Montgomery Stepp, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, so I, I have a general about this chapter um, and as, as the legislator, I really would like to incorporate additional California um, disenfranchisement 
specifically of the African American community with regard to um, formative, progressive, progressive, progressivism in California specifically, where yes, we have passed uh, laws um, that move us forward as a state, but there of some of what we have done is very similar uh, to the rest of the nation as far as the racial wealth gap and the like. So just kind of acknowledging that California, um, although we are um, moving a little bit ahead of, of the nation, one with this task force and, and in other ways, making sure that we are acknowledging that the results are similar because our system uh, are not changing in the way that they should. Um, just with regard to the recommendation, Vice Chair Brown mentioned uh, redistricting and diluting the black vote. Um, that's happening up and down California. And uh, I, I do think we should have a recommendation that addresses, addresses that because it's another covert way that in California our votes are diluted. And also um, the view of black representation as if it's not a, uh, a type of representation that can thrive in California. A lot of, of black representatives are being attacked in that way as well. Um, so elected representatives. So I just wanted to add that to the comment. So, so just so we understand, um, you, are suggesting that we add in a recommendation that addresses, um, recommends that the legislature consider legislation to, um, you know, sort of further prevent the dilution of the black vote through uh, redistricting, something along those lines. Uh, something along those lines. Uh, you know, I know we're being careful, but black participation in that process would be my preference. Of course, the Lawyers are probably going to say, can't include that. That would be my prayer. Well, Madam Chair, yes. uh, essentially what uh, our member this is, that, is saying, we have been disenfranchised in this state through political schemes, through public policy. That's the harm. That's the hurt. That's the damage. Other communities have stayed intact. They vote. They turn out. But these African American communities have been broken up. People have been pushed out by public policy. And yet others have been permitted to exist. That is discriminatory. That's blatant abuse of a people. And even psychologists say when an individual is isolated, there's injury done. And the damage. They may think, oh, you you want you, you want too much. No, not what we want. It's what we deserve and what we need. If it's good for other folks, it's good for us. We have that sense of presence. And that political engagement. Right now, here in San Francisco, Bear Mandarin is alive, kicking, and doing well. So we need to spell that out in terms of the harm and what the remedy, the panacea, must be.
So I think uh, what we need here then is a motion. It seems like you have a motion and a second already, but uh, Member Montgomery Stebb, it sounds like Dr. Brown's ready to second that, but could you make a, a motion um, to add in that recommendation? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm How you would frame it. Uh, I move that we add it to That would be um, the legislature should consider, consider uh, legislation to prevent the dilution of the black vote by the redistricting process in the state. I second. Thank you. It has been properly moved and seconded that Chapter 3, Political Disenfranchisement. Um, it's added another recommendation that the legislature consider legislation to prevent the dilution of the black vote through the redistricting process. Is there any discussion on the matter? Hearing no further discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for a roll call vote. Yes, Madam Chair, could you tell me who seconded that motion? Vice Chair Brown. Thank you. I will. <clears throat> Take the vote beginning with uh, Chair, uh, Chair Moore. Aye. Vice Chair Brown. Aye. Member Bradford. Aye. Member Grills. Aye. Member Holder. Member Holder votes aye. Aye. Member Joan Sawyer. Member Joan Sawyer. Member Joan Sawyer votes aye. Member Lewis. Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Tamaki. Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Member Montgomery Step. Aye. Member Montgomery Step. Thank you. Oh, votes aye. Madam Chair, the total members present in voting were nine, and there were nine ayes and zero nays. Thank you. There were nine ayes and zero nays. The ayes have it and the motion carries. Sorry, I didn't hear member Reggie Jones Sawyer. Did he communicate that to you? No. That there were eight members voting, president voting, and that there were eight ayes and zero nays. Okay, thank you. Let the record reflect that there are eight ayes, zero nays, and the ayes have it, and so the motion carries. There was one additional response I, I wanted to uh, mention, which is as part of our work that has been going on, we did retain an expert, uh, a legal expert, who is working on a survey um, of racist laws and case law uh, in California. Um, so we're, that is something that's in progress um, that we intend to include in, a, in sort of a final appendix to create member Montgomery step that record that you're talking about and really make make clear the history of, of racism, de jure ra racism in California. Okay, thank you for that. So we'll move on to chapter four, the roots of many evils, residential segregation. Any comments or questions about the preliminary recommendations or any additions? Member Gross, you're recognized. Can, um, can you hold the microphone close? Just... So I'd like to start with a, a question, particularly to the legislators. Um, one of the first recommendations says to reverse the effects of anti-black housing discrimination policies. I'm wondering whether or not that is too vague. Can you be a little bit more specific? I'm not sure what that specificity would be, but I also I'm not clear about the lack of do we need more specificity instead of the name of using the term reverse the effects should there be something on and so that maybe and we may not have the specific language to drill down at this moment but given that we have the two legislators who will be working on the final edits, 
that with their team they could bring more specificity so that it has more bite to it. And similarly with recommendation number or bullet three, it says prevent current banking and mortgage related discrimination um, and show could we provide more specificity rather than prevent, like what specifically would we be trying to recommend? And then there's a third thing, that, and, and this is a question. I'm not making it as a recommendation because I don't understand this particular area enough, but would it make sense to include a recommendation related to repealing um, Article 34, which requires a public vote to develop low-income rental housing and also uh, repealing the crime-free housing laws that disproportionately limit black residents' ability to access housing. So that's, a, again, a question, and I defer to the legislators to perhaps examine that uh, and see whether or not that is something that would be in line with the harms that we've seen and move the needle around redress. Also, with respect to housing, um, might we consider a recommendation, something to the effect of establishing state-subsidized mortgage systems that guarantees low interest rates for qualified Black California mortgage applicants? Any other comments or questions? Anyone would like to entertain a motion can do that as well. Okay, so can you restate your motion, please? Um, I move that we um, allow our advisory committee of legislators to revisit some of the vague language, such as reverse, um, and, in, and replace it with more specificity, and then also to look at the um, recommendations related to article, repealing Article 34, repealing the crime-free housing laws, and establishing state-subsidized mortgage Okay, you said crime-free? Crime-free housing laws. Okay, thank you. So it has been properly moved and seconded that the state legislatures, as part of the advisory committee, um, revisit some of the vague language in the report and uh, replace with more specificity um, in this particular chapter. And then also secondly, uh, recommend some discussion around Article 34, crime-free housing laws and state subsidized mortgage applications. Is there any discussion on the matter? Hearing no discussion, I will turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for roll call vote. Uh, before I uh, take the vote, I just wanted to clarify. I believe Bradford, uh, Member Bradford, seconded the motion before she completed the uh, the, the motion. So I want to make sure you're seconding the motion that she made. Yes, I will second. Thank you. The motion as completed by Dr. Grills. Stated. Thank you. I will <clears throat> begin taking the mo uh, the vote with the chair. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Brown. Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford. Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills. Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder. Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Joan Sawyer. Member Joan Sawyer is not voting. Member Lewis. Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Member Montgomery Step? Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. I call again. Member Joan Sawyer? Member Joan Sawyer? No vote. Thank you. 
Madam Chair, the total present and voting, present, I'm sorry, the total number of voting members is eight. There were eight ayes, one not voting, and zero nays. Thank you. There are eight ayes, one not voting, and zero nays. So the ayes have it, and the motion carries. We'll now move on to Chapter 5, Separate and Unequal Education. Any comments or questions or additions for the preliminary recommendations listed in Chapter 5? Um, um, this one, uh, mm -hmm. starting with, um, sorry, I can't see it. Um, that the, um, that we add a recommendation that, um, the California school disciplinary practices have been noted to be biased against black students. So a recommendation would be to implement a systematic review of public and private school disciplinary records and implement a statewide transition to equitable school disciplinary practices. Another recommendation would be to advance the timeline for implementation of ethnic studies classes in public and private high schools. That could be done before the 2025-2020 Another recommendation is related to pedagogy. So integrate culturally aligned approaches in public and private school um, teaching practices. Similar to the, um, the recommendations made by our expert witness um, yesterday, Dr. Joyce. In her testimony, her written testimony, she also provided a list of recommendations, which I would suggest um, they came out of the AERA um, in large measure, and I would recommend that we actually include all of those. Thank you. If you could uh, place those recommendations into a motion. I would move that we um, add that the California school disciplinary practices um, be addressed by implementing systematic review of public and private school disciplinary records. Secondly, advance the timeline for implementation of ethnic studies classes in public and private high schools. Um, third, adopt the recommendations in the expert witness testimony from Dr. Joyce King yesterday. Okay. Thank you. It's been properly moved and seconded that we'll add the following three preliminary recommendations to Chapter 5. Add school disciplinary systems addressed uh, through a systematic review of public and private schools in the state of California. Number two, advanced timeline for ethnic studies courses in public and private schools in the state of California. And three, to adopt the recommendations provided by expert witness Dr. Joyce Keene. Does that encapsulate everything? Okay, great, thank you. Is there any discussion on the matter? Hearing no further discussion, I'll go to Parliamentarian Johnson to cue a roll call vote. Thank you, I will take the vote on the three recommendations that set forth in the record, uh, beginning with Chair Moore. Aye. Vice Chair Brown. Aye. Member Bradford. Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder? Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Joan Sawyer? Member Joan Sawyer is off. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. And Member Montgomery Stepp? Aye. Member Montgomery Stepp votes aye. Madam Chair, there are eight members present in voting. There were eight 
<clears throat> excuse me, there were eight eyes and no nays, zero nays. Thank you. There are eight eyes and zero nays, and so the eyes have it, and the motion carries. We'll now move to Chapter Six. Madam R Chair, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I really apologize. I forgot one um, small shift in the last recommendation providing scholarships for all black high school graduates to cover four years of undergraduate education. And I would suggest that we add or trade school. Uh, given our discussion yesterday that now everyone wants to go to college, needs to go to college for their career interests, trade schools are very important. They do cost money. So we should, include, I would just say we should add or trade school to that last four. Okay. Second. Well, I was going to, Okay, well, it's been properly moved and seconded that we add trade schools to the last bullet for the preliminary recommendations. Uh, you can do that by consensus. Mm -hmm. You can do that by consensus if there's no objection. Okay. okay, is there any objections? Okay, I just want to bring to your attention that the bullet point at the top of page 17, it, it, it includes trade schools where it says provide funding for free tuition initiative Amer African American or American Freedmen owned and controlled schools, pre K to 12th grade, colleges and universities, trade schools, and professional schools. But then we'll add, as you said, trade schools to the last bullet point as well for scholarships. Okay, great. So, chapter six racism and environment and infrastructure. Any comments or questions or additions to the preliminary recommendations in this chapter? Oh, sorry, Member Gross, you're recognized. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would like to propose that we add the following recommendations in this area. First, develop state subsidies to support the work of community-based organizations in identifying black resident interests and needs within neighborhoods. For example, farmers markets, public transportation, et cetera. Secondly, develop state subsidies to support the work of community-based organizations to ensure safe access to neighborhood level physical activity spaces. There's mounting evidence that we may have a park, but it's not safe to use the park. Um, and so we need to address that. Third, reduce the um, density of food swamps. Um, for example, at high densities of fast food restaurants, in black neighborhoods that has health implications. Um, uh, fourth, in, introduce climate change mitigation and adaptive capacity strategies and measures. Um, for example, cooling centers, increasing green spaces that reduce urban heat um, and air pollutant concentration. And then lastly, address the unequal exposure to air pollutants associated with roadway and heavy truck traffic, oil drilling and heavy industry uh, in black neighborhoods. They are disproportionately impacted. If you could formulate that into a motion, thank you. Um, there's one more, sorry. sorry? <laughs> Tired. Um, support black neighborhoods to advance um, policies and practices that limit the unequal siting or locating of vice retail businesses. We have documented in South LA specifically, and there are published articles on this now from my lab, of the over-concentration of what we call the trifecta, the co-location of liquor stores, marijuana dispensaries, and tobacco or smoke shops. And where the liquor stores in the past were the primary culprit contributing to uh, crime and violence in black neighborhoods, the smoke shops or the tobacco shops are now outpacing them. And they're all co-located. So um, I think we can do this by consensus, correct? Is, is there any objections? I was just going to say that she started by saying... I, I proposed, but it wasn't I moved. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's fine to go with that as the motion, and we can... We'd I just ask that we can get the language from you uh, and, and pull it off of the video, but we're good there. Okay. So 
So it's been properly moved and seconded that we'll adopt the six additional recommendations listed by member Grills. Um, I can recite it if needed. Is there any further discussion on the matter? Montgomery. Yes. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the matter on this motion? Hearing no further discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentary and Johnson for roll call vote. Yes, again, could you repeat for the record who seconded the motion? Jovan Scott Lewis. Madam Chair, we'll begin the vote with you. Aye. Madam Chair votes aye. Madam, I'm sorry, um, Vice Chair Brown. Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford? Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder? Member Holder votes aye. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Member Montgomery Step? Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Madam Chair, there were eight members present in voting. There were eight ayes and zero nays. Thank you. There are eight ayes and zero nays. And so the ayes have it and the motion carries. Member Montgomery Step, you're recognized. Okay. All right. Move. Um, I would like to ask that we add, add the following recommend, recommendation that there be prioritize that we prioritize funding where there has been a historical lack of investment in infrastructure in black communities, infrastructure including uh, water infrastructure, piping, sidewalks, roads, lighting, um, and that is it. That qualifies for a motion. Is there a second? So it's been properly moved second. by Member Montgomery Step and properly seconded by Member Javon Scott Lewis to add to uh, the chapter on um, environmental racism and infrastructure the recommendation to prioritize funding uh, for the historical disinvestment um, in infrastructure in Black communities. Is there any further discussion on the matter? Here and no further discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson to cue a roll call vote. Thank you. I'll begin with <clears throat> Madam Chair. Aye. Madam Chair votes aye. Vice Chair Brown. Aye. Vi Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford. Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills. Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder. Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Lewis. Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Tamaki, aye. member Tamaki votes aye. And member Montgomery Step? Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Madam Chair, there were eight members present in voting. There were eight ayes and zero nays. Thank you, there were eight ayes and zero nays. The ayes have it and the motion carries. We'll now turn to chapter seven, pathologizing the black family. Any? Comments, questions, or additions to this chapter? If there aren't any, oh, sorry, member girls, you're recognized. So one of them has to do with the child welfare system and how that negatively, negatively impacts and generates black families. Um, so the recommendation that I would propose is that we review and adapt policy that block relative caregivers, um, the ability to take care of family members with, fam with children who have open child welfare cases, 
so that they are not only approved to care for these children uh, who are members of their family, but that they also um, are allowed to meet the requirements that will give them access to resources, and medical, and health stuff, and things for others to care for those families. All right, so is there, a, is that your motion? Is there a second? Okay. It has been properly moved by Member Grills and properly second, seconded by Member Montgomery Step to add an additional recommendation to chapter seven, pathologizing the black family. Is there any discussion on the matter? Hearing no further discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson to cue a roll call vote. Thank you very much. I'll begin with Chair Moore. Aye. Chair Moore, Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Brown. Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford. Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills. Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder. Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Member Montgomery Step? Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Madam Chair, there were eight members present in voting. There were eight ayes and zero nays. Thank you. There are eight ayes and zero nays. The ayes have it and the motion carries. So we'll now turn to chapter nine. Oh, sorry. Chapter eight, control over creative, cultural, and intellectual life. Any additions, comments, or questions related to the preliminary recommendations in chapter eight? Member girls who recognize. I have the same concerns with the vague language that can perhaps be made more precise in the report of our legislator, and that is with respect to reversing the effects of anti-Black discrimination policies, et cetera, and preventing discrimination in the industry of art, culture, et cetera. I think the general gist of those recommendations are good, but the, the initial language of reversing or preventing is not precise enough. I agree. And then there's also this added issue that some of that discrimination doesn't come out of policies per se. There's just ongoing, say, corporate practice that allows discrimination. Um, so we'd have to find some language that could help attend to practices that aren't necessarily encoded as policies. Formulate that into a motion that incorporates both comments. I mean, I think my comment falls under Dr. Grill's comment. It's just about the, the issue of greater specificity. So. Okay, great. So there's a second, which that counts as a motion. Yeah, and I, I second it. It has been properly moved by Member Grills and properly seconded by Jovan Scott Lewis uh, for the advisory board committee to revisit the language on reversing the effects of anti-Black discrimination policies in the areas of artistic, cultural, creative, athletic, and intellectual life um, to contain more specificity. Is there any discussion on the matter? Hearing no further discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for a roll call vote. Thank you. I will begin the call of the vote with Chair Moore. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Brown? Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford? Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder? Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. <clears throat> Excuse me. Member Montgomery Step? Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Madam Chair, there were eight members present in voting. There were eight ayes and zero nays. Thank you. There were eight ayes and zero nays. The ayes have it and the motion carries. We'll move to chapter nine, stolen labor and hindered opportunity. 
Any comments, questions, or additions to the preliminary to the preliminary recommendations in chapter nine? okay to move on let me know okay we'll go to chapter 10 in an unjust legal system any comments questions or additions to chapter 10 an unjust legal system There are any other member girls you recognize? So I would propose that we add to those recommendations um, the language to reduce disparities between stops and use of force. Uh, and that could consist of developing stronger accountability systems for officers that engage in harmful conduct uh, and reduce the scope of law enforcement authority within our public safety. Care centers, community based interventions, and ample funding for prevention that would support not just public safety, but community safety. When we suggest community safety, that invokes a much broader um, span of institutions and practices. Um, and then to reduce disparities in incarceration, uh, we need to root out policies such as prosecutorial conduct and sentencing that are nominally race neutral, but actually have racially disparate impacts. Secondly, root out anti-black implicit bias among law enforcement personnel, including prosecutors, judges, probation and parole officers, and de deputies and custody staff who um, work within the um, jail facility. Um, third, invest in institutions infrastructure that reduce the likelihood of criminal activity, such as care-based services, education, youth development, jobs, and living wages. Thank you. So if that counts as a motion, is there a second? So it has been properly moved by Member Grills and properly seconded by Member Montgomery Stepp to add the additional recommendations to chapter um, all right, 10, an unjust legal system. Is there any discussion on the additional recommendations proposed by member grills? Hearing no further discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentary Johnson to keep a roll, talk, roll call vote. Thank you. I will call for the vote on the recommendations made by member grills and seconded by my, member Montgomery Stepp, starting with Chair Moore. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Brown? Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford? Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Holder? Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Tamaki? Member Tamaki votes aye, and Member Montgomery Stepp? Aye. 
Member Montgomery Stepp votes aye. Madam Chair, there were eight members present in voting. There were eight ayes and zero nays. Thank you. There are eight ayes and zero nays, and so the ayes have it, and the motion carries. We'll now turn to Chapter 12, the wealth gap. Any additions, comments, or questions related to the preliminary recommendations in Chapter 12, the wealth gap? Uh, Sorry, we'll go back to chapter, we'll go to chapter 11, harm and neglect, mental, physical, and public health. Yes, Member Gross. So one of the things that I want to, I'd like to propose is that we um, ensure that within the healthcare, but especially within the healthcare system, there's a tendency to um, require that every intervention, particularly that's going to go through um, governmental entities, county departments of mental health, the um, probation department, et cetera, that the interventions have to be evidence-based practices. I suggest that we have a moratorium on requiring evidence-based practices required for interventions for the African-American community because those evidence-based practices in many cases are culturally bankrupt. They were not researched, designed, or um, uh, field-tested with our community to an, a degree that it would be consistent with best practice in research methods. They are also not methods that, and intervention strategies that our community resonates with. And so then when we drop out immediately after one or two sessions, or we don't go in the first place, we then have that turned back against us as saying things like we are not psychologically minded and ready for intervention or treatment. Uh, and that's far from the case. Secondly, we do have precedent in the state of California and within the county of Los Angeles to do culturally defined evidence practices. So I would suggest um, that we consider in particular um, the policy options for community defined evidence practices. Um, there's a concept paper that can be found in the office of uh, health equity in the California Department of Public Health that lays that out. In particular, I think we should have a recommendation surrounding also making Medi-Cal reforms, including advancing and innovating, innovative, um, in innovating Medi-Cal framework, uh, the Cal AIM, making it more flexible to allow for the addition of community-defined evidence practices to the suite of billable outpatient services available to black consumers. And that could be a powerful um, lift um, that we could um, be shepherding as, as a task force. There, is a, there, are, there are additional resources that the legislators could refer to in that regard. And we do have data coming out now showing the benefits of community-defined evidence practices which are prevention and early intervention strategies designed by the black community, implemented by the black community, and determined as effective by the black community. I thank you, Member Grills. So that's your motion, that's the motion. Is, is there a second? Second. So it's been properly moved by Member Grills and properly seconded by Member Bradford to add um, additional recommendations to uh, this particular chapter. Any discussion on the matter? Hearing no further discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for roll call vote. I'm just gonna say, uh, just one uh, point of order, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, we, 
in, implicit in the uh, motion is then that we would work with the advisory committee to finalize and formulate that recommendation. Right. Mm -hmm. Important distinction. No problem. No problem. It's the argument and justification at the same time. So. I will begin the vote with the call of the vote from Chair Moore. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Brown? Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford? Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grill? Aye. Member Grill votes aye. Member Holder? Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Member Montgomery Step? Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Madam Chair, there were eight members present in voting. There were eight ayes and zero nays. Thank you. There were eight ayes and zero nays. And so the motion carries as the ayes have it. We'll now turn to chapter 12, the wealth gap. Any comments, questions, or additions? to the preliminary recommendations listed in chapter 12 on the wealth gap. Chapter 13, excuse me, which is the last chapter. I just want to make a note that the Roman numerals are off in the executive summary. It's listed as Roman numeral 12 when it should say 13. Yeah, I, um, the formatting uh, is the 12 chapters plus the introduction, and so that's what's throwing off the idea that it's 13. So the introduction is coming first, then the 12 chapters, and we also have the executive summary. So I'll clear that up when, when it comes time to vote on the whole. Thank you. Lay it all out. Any comments, questions, or additional? Or ads? Go ahead, member girls. Uh, one short thing on this one um, that we, I propose we consider providing funding and technical assistance for black-led and black based community land trusts. Um, the focus and emphasis would be to support wealth building and create permanent affordable housing. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. It's been properly moved and seconded, uh, moved by member Grills and seconded by Vice Chair Brown to add another uh, preliminary recommendation to the last chapter of the report on the wealth gap. Any discussion on the matter? Hearing no further discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for a roll call vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will begin the vote with a vote from Madam Chair. Aye. Madam Chair votes aye. Vice Chair Brown. Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford. Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills. Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder. Member Holder votes aye. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Member Montgomery Step? Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Madam Chair, there were eight members present in voting. There were eight ayes and zero nays. Thank you. There were eight ayes and zero nays. The ayes have it and the motion carries. So I know there are some um, additional slides or information, I think from member Holder and then myself about the report. So we're waiting for the slides to be put up. Uh, Parliamentarian Johnson, can you check your phone, please? Do you have your phone near you? Your phone? Can you check your phone? Thank you. Okay, so this is just um, 
revisiting the suggestions that I offered for the report. Uh, the first suggestion that I offered was changing references to Black Americans to African Americans, um, particularly um, adding a discussion that African American isn't necessarily a race, it's a distinct group or historical signifier to dis for a distinct lineage. Um, and in my past report, I noticed I noted that African American has been used since the 1700s by African Americans to define themselves, and that they can also be interchangeably used with American freedmen, but I think the main point in terms of uh, my suggestion to change from Black Americans to African Americans is that in AB 3121, Black Americans isn't noted or cited. Um, African Americans is, and of course, African Americans who descend from chattel slavery is noted. So that's the suggestion that I'm offering. And then the second suggestion that I was offering um, in light of the conversation that we had last time, not necessarily to plainly substitute race and racism and caste and casteism, but to have a discussion about how African-Americans who descend from chattel slavery not only suffer from racism, but also casteism. And then I know member Holder had um, a potential um, Madam Chair, if, if I could offer mm -hmm. a suggestion. If you're going to, you have report number one, uh, you have two recommendations. You want to ask for a, a motion and do them separately, bifurcate them so that they'll be acted on individually. So ask for a motion for the first, and then you'll also need a second for that, for each of them. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so I'd like to entertain a motion on either of these two changes. I move that in the interim report, we change black Americans to African Americans. Second. It has been properly moved by Jovan Scott Lewis, member Jovan Scott Lewis, and properly seconded by member Vice Chair Brown, that in the interim report, we change reference from black American to African American. Is there any discussion on the matter? I would only add that Again, I, as an individual who identifies as African-American, truly understand where we're going, but as stated earlier by one of the uh, individuals who spoke during oral communications, there are whites that identify as Africans. There are Asians that identify as Africans. So I'm just saying, I think you open it up again to more people to say, oh, I'm African-American if I come from... South Africa or whatever the case may be. So I'm just curious about that. Can I, can I respond to that? Yeah. I was thinking about that and there was the public commenter who made that. Well, and you know, in my experience or observation, somebody would not come here, say from Nigeria and call themselves an African American. They would call themselves an African or they would call themselves a Nigerian American. And so I think, you know, the way that the African in this African-American operates is because of the vagueness, because of Africans who were brought here through slavery do not actually know where in Africa they come from, right? I mean, that's changing, I guess, through DNA, et cetera. But I, I don't think, you know, like myself, I'm a Jamaican-American, right? I, you know, and I think there's an important national to nation, sorry, nation to nation distinction that shows up if someone is actually coming here from continental Africa where they identify with the actual country of origin and not the continent per se when they add the hyphen America. Um, but I take your point. I mean, there's comments about Elon Musk considering himself an African American. Um, but I don't know if that, I would, I would, sounds more like conjecture to me. And I don't, I've never encountered that. Um, personally. So I would want some more evidence that there are Africans who come to America as immigrants and consider themselves African-American as a way of designating their African heritage. Um, I, haven't, I haven't encountered it, but if you have, then that's something else. I've encountered it, and, but yes, go ahead, member. Thank you. Um, I would just, I would just ask that it is 
clearly defined for purposes of the report. You know, it is in the uh, statute. So um, that there is no, if we define it in the report, then we don't move away from that in the report. Um, and, and so I think that um, the way that you have it here just needs to be um, clear in the report if, if we make this change. I mean, the other thing that I was thinking about was just the fact that we do reference in the report um, because we don't have that disaggregated data, we do reference, you know, reference a lot in the studies that we um, reference. You know, in that in that case, I think it just should. I think it should stay true to to whatever that study uh, says, and, and just because that's the purpose of a reference. But other than that, I think that I'm supported. Member Holder, you're recognized. Reiterate with, mem with member uh, Montgomery that just, yeah. I would reiterate what member Montgomery Stepp said um, at the end regarding the studies that are the underpinning for this report and staying consistent with the language of the studies which are not disaggregated um, along these lines. I think that this report has to always, we always have to embed the language that we use throughout the study in the reports that are the underpinning um, for, for the overarching report. And it's, it's going to be critical that any language that we use is evidence-based in order for our study to seem methodologically sound. Um, so I, I don't think it, I would caution against changing this language. I think it undermines the methodology of the report and overall. Member Gross. So I wished I was at home so I could just kind of pull up from my computer the things I'm about to reference. But I think um, to member Jovan Scott, the issue about how we self-identify is fairly complicated. Um, and there have been some studies that looked at how African immigrants, African descendant immigrants, whether they're coming from Caribbean countries or from um, parts of Europe or from um, the continent, uh, how they self-identify. And sometimes the self-identification is more a political choice in the face of the harsh realities of racism in the United States. So they're, they're one, what some of these studies have suggested is that people are self-identifying in ways to both practically and psychologically protect themselves from the um, anti-black sentiments and stereotypes. And so because they see how um, black Americans who are descendant, direct descendants of enslaved folks in this country are um, relegated to the bottom of the, the, the list of people who, call, who qualify as human beings. Um, why would I then designate that self, that for myself, and potentially minimize my capacity to benefit from the resources in this country or to able to access opportunities in this country. So it's, it may not be how I truly see myself, but it may have a lot to do with how this country has structured how black people are seen and therefore how black people are treated. Um, I'm not sure that this distinction is particularly because the area to me is murky, um, adds clarity to our process. Any other questions, comments? Let's go ahead, Member Tamaki. Yeah. Oh, obviously, I'm the only non-black member, only non-black member on the task force. So, with respect to identity and how a group uh, wants to be identified or self-identified, frankly speaking, I don't think that's my. 
but I do want to make a comment about the report, which I've read thoroughly. And that is, uh, there's one area in connection with who the eligible class is. And the task force has spoken on that issue in the March meeting. Um, and so that's one indicator or label or moniker or uh, identif identifier is probably the best word. The other one is the report is replete with data. Everything's backed up. I mean, it's very heavily footnoted. And uh, unfortunately, the data sets that a lot of this stuff comes from is not disaggregated. When we talk about housing discrimination and uh, the number of uh, healthcare in particular or employment, it's not disaggregated. And it's, it's described in the underlying studies and reports uh, as black. And so that part I'm sympathetic to. I think we really do have to uh, stay faithful to the underlying data and not confuse uh, with, the, with the names, which really refer to two different things. One is a self-identification of a people uh, and a particular class. And the other one is uh, the reports of the disparities that have happened because of the horror show of racism. Uh, so <clears throat> we can't introduce, I think, the same terminology for that issue. And I think we've got to uh, be consistent with uh, how the report, you know, treated that data. I hope that. Any other comments, questions, or discussion on the matter? Well, I'll just say, you know, I personally identify as a Black American, and I think Smokey Robinson um, was recently on The View, and he talked about how he himself, he's never been to Africa, he doesn't consider himself an African-American and he resents the term African-American because, and he cited, for instance, you know, black Americans who served in war, they didn't go to Vietnam to fight, you know, in his words for Timbuktu, that's what he said. But he went to war, uh, they went to war to fight for Mississippi and Texas um, and in the Southern states. And so I just wanna make that clear to the community because I wanna recognize that there is a conversation in the black community about how we identify. And many people in the black community are, you know, stating that they rather identify as black or now American freedmen. As we know, American freedmen is a term that came in 1865 after emancipation with the establishment of the Freedmen's Bureau that changed the political status of an enslaved African to an American freedman. Um, so there is a movement, grassroots, to self-identify Black people as American freedmen and not African-American. I just want to put that on the table. But the only reason why I added this, and again, this is just a discussion. We don't have to approve it. We'll, we'll go to a vote shortly. Um, but I just wanted to make sure there was some consistency with the language in the statute and the language of the report. That was really my main motivation and then secondly, I brought this up at the last hearing about, you know, there are conservative watch groups that are watching these types of reforms and they are ready to attack in the event that anything looks racial. <laughs> and so as a preemptive strike, it's kind of another reason why or my motivation for the change. But I just want to state on the record that I'm perfectly fine with it stating as Black American, but I just wanted to offer a potential change because of those two, those two um, points. Um, any comments, questions? I just want to reiterate what Member Tamaki said uh, moments ago, which is that we have the community of eligibility. The bill says African American with special consideration, right? And we have effectively put forward the motion and voted for the community of eligibility, effectively comporting with that language. Um, so your introduction, I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused by what you've just added, um, but I guess it's a clarification of your personal feelings versus what you're, okay. Um, 
So, I mean, I think, you know, that's, that's what's in the bill. You know, it comports with what we voted on last month. And, and so I think that's, that's why I was, you know, willing to support the recommendation with the motion of, of um, changing black Americans to African Americans. And I think, you know, it's been noted, um, there was a public comment earlier, I think it was by Chris from CJEC, you know, that a part of the, a part of the work is actually determining this sense of self-identification. And that's not the job of the task force to decide <laughs> what black people, African Americans, American freedmen, you know, that's the work of, of this community to decide. And that's, and that's the work that has been long denied them. Um, but scope of our work, we are handed a bill, the bill has language, we've put forward a community of eligibility, largely instructed by that language. And so I think, you know, these edits really aren't terribly controversial for what we are charged with doing. Thank you. Member Gross, yeah. Just one last comment. So I, I was taking issue with the way in which um, black immigrants self-identify, but not necessarily with the idea of the term African American. In fact, it was my mentor who advised Jesse Jackson to shift to the term African American as opposed to black. Um, and she was directly in alignment with Dr. John Henry Clark, who I would use those two more than Smokey Robinson as a <laughs> reference on. <laughs> um, but but and both and, and the reasoning behind their their discussion of terms like African-American over black actually is in contradiction to some things that you mentioned. Specifically, Dr. Clark and Dr. Ramona Edelin said that to name a people based on a color disconnected from a place, an origin, a history, right, and a, set, and a worldview is to essentially have a people without any context. And so... Excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me. There's to be no debate from the floor. Thank you. And so I just wanted to clarify that I'm actually, personally, I like African American, but I also recognize the limitations of that terminology. And the last point I want to make about this is that um, that's, that sub-bullet about African American is not a race. I don't think we want to argue that point, you know, because too much because the census uses black or African American as our racial category. So whenever we look to what are the governmental distinctions or specifications, they put those two together. Thank you. So I'll restate the motion on the floor. So it was properly moved by member Jovan Scott Lewis and properly seconded by Vice Chair Brown that we, for the interim report, change Black American to African American. Um, yes. Okay. Called for the question, Parliamentarian Johnson. It will call for the vote on the motion on the floor, beginning with uh, Chair Moore. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Brown? Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford? I'm sorry. Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Tamaki? Same. Member Tamaki abstains. Member Montgomery Step. Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Madam Chair, there were eight members voting. There were seven ayes, zero nays, and one abstention. Thank you. There were seven ayes, zero nays, and one abstention. The ayes have it, and the motion carries. Okay, this last one I'm not too invested I'm on. I'm sorry, did I call? No, I don't think member you called Holder? member Holder. I was gonna say that you didn't. No, you didn't. I did not. Please state your vote. <laughs> I'll abstain. Oh. Thank you. Uh, oh. Member Holder abstains. I have to change my report. Uh, there were eight members voting. 
there were six eyes and two abstentions. Thank you. So there were six eyes, zero nays, and two abstentions. And so the eyes have it, and the motion carries. Okay, the second change, again, not too invested on, um, given the comments um, already by my esteemed colleagues. So in the event that we'd like to entertain a motion to incorporate this or not, uh, we can do that now. Or we can just, by consensus, we can just say we don't want to do this. <laughs> you, you, you don't have to do anything. No. It, it, okay. no, it, it, there's you no motion. Die by the lack of emotion. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so, great. So we'll move on to the next item on our agenda. But I wanted to give space in the event that um, task force members has any comments about the forward, the forward that I wrote, because that's also going to be a part of the interim report. Um, yes, member Gross. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think your forward has an opportunity to kind of lift up the, the, the aerial view on the issue of reparations um, and, and um, why it is so important and um, that it is a... Um, it's a debatable topic in terms of how it is understood and seen. Um, and just was hoping that perhaps you could elaborate some more on those kinds of things in the Like the different perspectives in the reparation space. And that this is an opportunity for this task force to begin to address those things and that we are trying to do that with input from a cross section of the California Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I've left my notes, but yeah, I had comments along those same lines that elaborate a little bit more on the importance of what we're doing. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Um, I know I want to acknowledge the letter that member Holder submitted in the event that you wanted to share. Any comments on it? Well, it's, from what I can tell, it seems moot. The forward that I commented on. Oh, yeah, it seems like the forward that I commented on is different from the one that I'm looking at here. So it may be moot. Okay. All right, well, if there aren't any other comments or questions, I want to turn it back to Attorney Newman and Attorney Yang in the event there, that there are any additional notes. No, uh, we have, I think, extensive feedback, which we'll uh, go ahead. I would suggest um, what we need in order to move forward to the final uh, report is a motion approving uh, the 12 chapters, introduction and executive summary with the recommendations um, as you all have discussed throughout the day um, with the direction to the advisory committee of member uh, Bradford and Joan Sawyer um, to work with us as we finalize and do the final formatting and get the report ready for production. Okay. We did that, correct? <laughs> We already did that. No, we need we need. I oh, need a universal. Okay. We need a vote. That, yeah, you've been. All right. So, do you like entertain a motion um, on that matter? Okay. Is there a second? So it has been properly moved by Senator Bradford and properly seconded by Member Grills that we authorize the advisory board committee that comprises of. Senator Bradford and Assemblymember Reggie Jones Sawyer to work alongside the California Department of Justice to finalize um, the edits, including the additional recommendations listed in today's session for the introduction and the 12 chapters of the interim report. Is there any discussion on the matter? And the executive summary. And the executive summary, excuse me. You, you need to say that you approve the 
report with those recommendations that you mentioned? To approve the report. Okay, so I'll restate the motion. This motion on the floor is for the advisory board committee that comprises the Senator Bradford and Assembly Reggie Jones Sawyer to work alongside the Department of Justice to approve the executive summary, introduction, and 12 chapters, including the additional preliminary recommendations stated in today's session for the interim report. Well, I, I Not exactly. The, no, the motion no. needs to approve mm -hmm. of the report and then everything else. And then the advisory committee. Oh, okay. Okay. So the motion on the floor is to approve the report with the additional recommendations um, that we discussed today. Okay. Thank you for that. Is there any discussion on the matter? Hearing no further discussion. I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for a roll call vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will begin with Madam Chair's vote. Aye. Madam Chair votes aye. Vice Chair Brown? Aye. Vice Chair Brown votes aye. Member Bradford? Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder? Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Member Montgomery Step. Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Madam Chair, there were eight members present in voting. There were eight ayes and zero nays. Thank you. There were eight ayes and zero nays. The ayes have it and the motion carries. So it's now 1237. Um, lunch is supposed to start from 12 to noon. So should we 12 to 1, excuse me. And so can we still have an hour for lunch and just move, um, we'll, we'll start back approximately at 1.38 p.m.? Parliamentarian Johnson? Yes. Okay. So we'll um, revisit and reconvene at 1.38.